Here's a big idea. The biggest ideas don't always start big. They begin as a tiny spark, only seen by those who know how to look, brought to life by a shared desire to change what's possible. From inventing the touchscreen technology that connects you to the world, to outfitting the astronauts who orbit around it, at the University of Delaware, ideas grow until they become bigger than big and challenge the way the world thinks. Because UD was built to create impact at every scale. From studying the nuances of how we move through our world, to protecting the vast expanses of our ocean environments, through graduates who are there to shape our country and leaders who continue to impact our world today. Through students driven by passion and values and friendships that start in Delaware and span the globe. We are inspired to stand together because that's what Blue Hens do. Together, we make connections on a human scale. Together, we pivot into bold new territory. Together, we give the smallest lives the biggest advantage because we know the size of an idea can only be measured by its impact. At the University of Delaware, the ideas bring us together and together, we make them giant. Hello, Blue Hens, and welcome to New Student Orientation. My name is Kelly Murray, and I serve as the Interim Director for Orientation and Transition Programs. I am thrilled to have you all here today, and I am excited for you to join the Blue Hen community this spring. To the students here, you are on the correct link. We have a family portion today and a student portion, but we'll start together. So you'll learn a little bit more about our schedule in a little bit. Um, but I hope that you consider today your first day as a Blue Hen. Take advantage of your time in your NSO session today. Ask questions, connect with your new classmates and orientation leaders in your small group sessions, and learn more about what you can expect as a new UD student. To the parents and families with us today, I encourage you to also make the most of your time in today's session. I know that your students' transition to Delaware is a significant transition for you too. And I hope that after today, you feel more informed and confident knowing UD is a university that will both challenge and support your student. Throughout today's session, staff and student leaders from orientation and transition programs will be available to assist with questions. And shortly, you'll learn more about our team and today's schedule from our student coordinator, Connor Holm. If you have questions throughout the session, please feel free to use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen to submit them. In addition, closed captioning is available today. You can select the live transcript button to start seeing captions on your screen. And again, for those just joining us, students, you are on the correct link this morning. It's now my pleasure to introduce a special message from UD's Vice President for Student Life, Dr. Jose Luis Riera. Dr. Riera has served in his role as Vice President since November 2018, and he's been in the Division of Student Life at UD since 2010. Through his leadership as Vice President, Dr. Riera seeks to promote student success and facilitate learning, development, and career readiness for students within communities that value well being, social engagement, and inclusion. Thank you so much, Kelly, and hello, Blue Hens, and happy. Blue Hen Friday. Welcome to UD. As Kelly said, my name is Jose Riera and I do have the privilege to serve as a Vice President for Student Life and welcome you this morning to new student orientation. I'm absolutely thrilled to both welcome you as our newest Blue Hens um, in a very momentous time in our university's history. And I'm so glad that you have decided to join our community now. And let me welcome all of your families too, our newest Blue Hen families. We wanna answer all of your questions today and hopefully calm any anxieties you may have as well. You know, UD continues to attract great talent. We chose you because we believe you'll do great things here. And most importantly, we are confident that you have what it takes to be successful at UD. We understand that you're eager to find others with whom you can relate, 
understand more about your classes and your academic life here at the institution and affirm that this is the right place for you. And that is what we hope to do today. So we would encourage you to ask questions, uh, make sure that you walk away with the information that you're hoping um, to have as this day comes to a close. But I also wanna remind you that today is a beginning. It's, it's a beginning to understand your new identity as a University of Delaware Blue Hen. And it's not the end. And so give yourself the grace that you need uh, to really transition into this new environment. It takes time. Um, and we are here to walk alongside you and provide any support that can be helpful for you. You know, as Vice President for Student Life, I've learned a lot about what it means to be a Blue Hen by interacting and observing countless students throughout my time at UD. Here are three ways I've come to understand what it means to be a Blue Hen. First, Blue Hens see familiar things with new eyes. Blue Hens are focused on and value learning. You'll have an opportunity to think critically about the influencers, the music, the movies, and books you know, as well as new ones that you'll encounter during your time at UD. You'll examine what you know about your community, your social circles, even your own thoughts, beliefs, and opinions. You'll ask yourself why and how these things came to be. Whether your perspective is changed or confirmed, it's how we believe real growth happens. Second, I've learned that blue hens try new things, they go new places, they meet new people, and they embrace the full diversity of the world. While you're here, I hope you'll consider taking a few courses outside of your major, getting involved in a cause, studying abroad, befriending those who are different than you, learning a new skill, maybe even starting a new business. You never know, the novel experience may be what leads you to your next steps after leaving UD. As you meet new people and encounter new cultural experiences, my hope for you is that you'll be moved to commit to creating a more socially just society. You'll never have a better time in your life to explore for the sake of exploring. You never know what you'll discover, especially about yourself. And finally, I've learned that blue hens serve others. We believe true education means being consequential in the world. That is using your learning to positively impact others and those around you. You'll have opportunities to serve right here in the New Art community, maybe helping people with chronic illnesses, mentoring youth, or raising money for children with cancer. Or you can serve on the other side of the world, meeting the medical, infrastructure, or housing needs of people. However you choose to serve others, we know that you will grow and that you will refine your passion and purpose that will ultimately drive your decisions post-graduation. You know, during new student orientation today and welcome days as the spring semester kicks off, we will introduce you to numerous opportunities that are available this coming semester that are designed to start you off on the path to success. Take advantage of these. Become known to your community and get to know your community as you engage within it. To support you, we offer a myriad of services and programs from mental health counseling, leadership development, career consulting, life design, medical care, to academic advising and support. Avail yourself to these resources. They are here to help you achieve your goals. If you don't know how to connect with one, just ask someone. We will happily get you the answer. For now, students, please continue to connect with us through Canvas, and parents, please continue to connect with us through the Blue Hen Family Hub, which will really be your primary link to the university through your students' time here. We also welcome all to follow our social media channels so that you can be informed on the latest UD news. So once again, welcome to our newest Blue Hens. We're so excited you're kicking off your Blue Hen journey. And as our newest Blue Hens, I really hope that you'll come to embrace everything that that new identity means. Enjoy your time today, and I'll look forward to seeing you on campus this spring. Thanks so much. And now I wanna turn it over to Connor Holm. 
All right, thank you so much, Jose. Hi, everyone. It's really, really great to be on the Zoom here with you today. Like Jose said, my name is Connor Holm. I am a senior English and biology double major from Hapro, Pennsylvania. My programs are he, him, and I'm a student coordinator here with New Student Orientation. All right, so kind of jumping into this last little segment of our welcome session. So um, first of all, um, we wanted to one, introduce you to me as I'm gonna be um, answering some questions and helping give some of the student perspective here in this session. But I also wanted to take the time to quickly introduce some of our orientation leader team. So they're not on the Zoom here with us at the moment, they're getting ready for the students. Um, they're getting ready to see you really shortly, but our orientation leaders we have here today are Katie, Carolyn, and Geraldine. So they are super excited to meet all the students here today. And I hope you are too. Like I said, they're getting the Zoom prepared for you just now. Um, but we will transition to kind of get to know all of you. So this is your opportunity. If you can do us a favor and post in the chat, where are you from? Or why are you excited to be a blue hen? So we want to get some hype, see what everybody's saying here today. So like I said, you can just post in the chat, say where you're from, why you're excited to be here today because we really want to hear from all of our wonderful Blue Hen students. All right, let's see, New York, Saudi Arabia, all right. Bahamas, Chester County, Delaware, New Jersey, people from all over, all right. New Jersey, Massachusetts, this is my favorite part. I really do love seeing where everyone's from. Newcastle, New York, Virginia, Delaware. Wow, there's a lot of people here from a lot of different places today. All right, Magnolia, Delaware, Connecticut. Two people from Connecticut, bunch from Delaware, PA, Baltimore. This is super exciting. All right, let's see. Another Delaware, Chapel Hill. All right, no, you guys are from so many really, really fun places, Long Island, Maine. All right, well, thank you so much for sharing with us. It's really exciting to see where everybody's from. It's really exciting to hear from everyone. More Delaware, more Maryland, New Jersey, Cecil County, Maryland. Awesome, well, thank you so much for sharing with us. Um, I hope it's cool, one, for you to see where everybody's from, but also see that you're not alone, right? If you're from Delaware, if you're from places that aren't Delaware, we have a lot of students who kind of share a lot of those same places. So that's really, really awesome. All right, and now we can move on to talk about the student schedule. So we're kind of gonna go and do a little overview of what we're looking at for the schedule here today. So students, yes, again, this is the correct place for you to be. So we're gonna have the academic life session right after this. So that is your opportunity to learn what it's gonna be like to be a student here at the University of Delaware. Following that, we will post and then finally open that student link. So students, you'll get the chance to meet your orientation leaders with a great session called Blue Hen 101. So it'll give you all the information that you need in order to be successful outside of the classroom. Then with orientation leaders, you'll learn what it means to build an inclusive community here at the University of Delaware, followed by how to be um, health, healthy and um, safe here on campus. So that'll all be led by your orientation leader. And it'll be a really great time if you do not only meet them, but to get to meet other students here on the Zoom. Now we can transition to the family and guest schedule for today. So similarly, you all will stay here for the academic life session. Again, learning what it's like to be a blue hen in the classroom. Following that though, while the students leave, families and guests, you will stay here. So you'll get to have the student life session. So learn what it's like for your student outside of the classroom, followed by health and well-being, easing the transition into college, and then finally a student Q&A panel. All right, and then the final thing that we have on the schedule for our welcome session, we have our Blue Hen Barnes & Noble Bookstore Spirit Award. So this is an award we like to give to your student every orientation day to celebrate them for being super spirit, spirited and super excited to um, come to our Zoom today. So the winner of our UD Barnes & Noble Bookstore Spirit Award for today is, and we'll do a little virtual drum roll, please. The winner is Jason Patterson. Congratulations, Jason. We'll send a little piece of information in the chat and also reach out to you. Um, and that's super exciting. Thank you for being spirited today. And thank you everybody for being spirited, being excited to be here. Um, I know that being on Zoom for a long period of time can sometimes be a lot, but I hope we're gonna have a lot of really exciting and informative programs for you here today. So with that, we're going to transition into academic life. So 
Chuck Schirmeyer, you can get us started. Thank you so much. Okay, well, good morning, everybody, or good afternoon or good evening here from Newark, Delaware. Um, I saw in the, the chat, we have folks from a lot of different time zones, and we are just so excited to have you here at the University of Delaware. This is the Academic Life presentation, and uh, we're going to talk about academic advising, course registration, important dates and deadlines, and of course, resources to help you be successful here at the University of Delaware. As Connor said, I'm the Senior Assistant Dean uh, for Undergraduate Services in the College of Engineering, and I'm just happy to be your host for this part of the session today at New Student Orientation. Let's go to the next slide. So there's several groups of students in the room, as you might have guessed. We have first year students, transfer students, international students who might be one of the first two categories. And we have World Scholar students with us today. Welcome each and every one of you. Because we have so many different kinds of uh, students in the room today, the virtual room, um, we're going to be giving fairly general information that applies to everyone. Now, I know that some of you have already attended your Meet Your College session and some of you have not, but suffice to say you've learned or will learn more specific information at that session through your Canvas course and during academic advisement appointments. Please check your Blue Hen Home Portal for more information as you need. And obviously, we also want to welcome family and support persons here in the Zoom with us today. There will be some time for questions at the end, so um, just keep that in mind. Jot them down, uh, put them in the chat if you have them, and we'll get to them uh, pretty soon. Next slide. So whether you're a first year student or you're transitioning from another institution into the University of Delaware, this is a new beginning for you. And therefore, it's a great opportunity for you to learn how to be your own best advocate. And what I mean by that is kind of what Dr. Rier was saying about reaching out to other places to get help that you might need to be a successful student here at the University of Delaware. Um, but parents and family members and support persons it's also important that you help your student to be their best advocate here. You have probably a little bit more experience and wisdom in these things, and together you teaming up with your student will help them to be their, their, do their best here at the University of Delaware. There are many websites, resources, and other places where you can find information, um, and it's just important, again, that you reach out to do that. Myself, along with others, are here to help you as well. And so um, we just want you to, you know, again, reach out when you need help. One of the passive resources that Dr. Rear also mentioned is the Blue Hen Family Hub, um, which you'll hear more about later today. Let's switch to the next slide. <clears throat> I never thought about this when I went to school, but, you know, universities are made up of colleges and schools. And so you see 10 different academic units here on the slide. Uh, there are colleges and there are schools and departments within these departments are majors. And don't be surprised, it's normal, that your student will identify more with the major that they're in than the department or college or, or anything like that that they're in. Um, so they might say, well, I'm a psychology major. They won't say, oh, I'm in the College of Arts and Sciences. So that's pretty, pretty cool. Now, in each of these units is an assistant dean or someone like an assistant dean like me, who is here to help support students. You may have met us at an earlier recruitment event. Maybe you've already met us at an academic session. Maybe you've just seen our name written somewhere, hopefully not on a poster at the post office. Next slide, please. Obviously, in any institution like ours, there are some important dates that you should be aware of. So I'm going to talk a little bit about those. But students, you should also continue to monitor email at the university because sometimes there are updates to this academic calendar and you'll want to know what they are. So first of all, February 6th is the first day of classes for the spring 2023 semester. We do have 8 a.m. classes, so get some sleep the night before. And I also want to, to remind students to visit the Student Life website to see the schedule for the 1743 Welcome Days. This is an extension of our new student orientation. Um, the website should be live today, and you'll also get some direct communication about it as well. Now, February 17th, which is 10 class days into the semester, is the last day to drop classes or add classes for the spring. So this is a typical kind of thing in an institution like ours. 
However, we want to make sure that you always talk with your academic advisor before you make any changes to your spring schedule. We really don't want you to alter your schedule, even though you could, um, because frankly, you may kind of break it and we may not be able to fix it. So please make sure you talk to your advisor before making any changes to your schedule. Seven weeks into the semester, March 24th is when we do freshman and transfer midterm grades. <clears throat> they will be posted in what's called UDSIS. That stands for the University of Delaware Student Information System. By the way, we do say UDSIS, not UDSIS, just so you want to say it correctly. The midterm grade uh, posting is a good chance for you to kind of evaluate how you're doing in a class. And if you're experiencing any difficulties, at, at minimum, you should be meeting with your academic advisor at this point. However, Lou Hen students who want to be successful recognize probably earlier than midterms that they're having difficulty. And so reach out for help before this time so that you can get good grades and, and move on with your academic work. All right. Now, March 27th to March 31st is our spring break. Um, so don't plan to go anywhere before uh, the 24th because that's the last Friday before this and you will probably have exams or assignments that are due. And then April 3rd is when summer session course registration begins. This will come sooner than you think. Um, and in the summer, there's two five-week back-to-back sessions. There's the seven-week extended session, and there's a 10-week long extended session. Summer session is a good time to catch up on coursework or to get ahead as wanted. April 17th, a day before my birthday, just in case you want to know or send me cards, um, is the fall semester course registration. That's when that begins. And the same kind of thing. Um, you'll want to meet with an advisor before you register for this uh, for your fall courses. Um, seniors register first in all sessions because they have the most earned credits. So if you're a transfer student, you may have some earned credits that come in. If you're a freshman, you probably won't have too many. And so you won't register until later in the week that registration opens. So make sure, again, you talk with your advisor, um, schedule an appointment with them before you have to register for classes. May 1st is a very, very important day. It's the last day to change spring course registration. Well, what does that mean exactly? Well, this is a date 11 weeks into the semester, and this is the last day in the semester that you can change your registration for a course. Most courses you will register for for standard grading, which means you'll get an A, B, C, D, hopefully not an F. OK, this is the day where if you think you're not doing well in a class, you can withdraw from a class, which means you stop attending, stop doing any work for it. You'll get a W on your transcript. It won't hurt your GPA. You'll have to take the course over again if needed, that kind of thing. You could also audit the class, which means you're listening to the class. You don't have to do any of the work for the class for the rest of the semester, but you do, do still have to attend. So make an appointment with your advisor before you make decisions about what to do uh, by May 1st. And please don't wait to the last minute. Make sure you contact your advisor well in advance of this May 1st deadline. Next slide, more important dates because there are many. May 16th will come very quickly, believe it. It'll be the last day of classes for the spring. May 17th is a day for reading and studying, getting ready for finals. May 18th through the 25th are final exams. I always tell students, don't make any travel arrangements uh, before all your finals are finished. You'll know that because for two reasons. One is the university publishes a finals schedule for all of your classes. That should be available the week before classes start or for sure when classes start in spring. And your professors are going to have it on their syllabus or make announcements in class about when their final exam will be given. So just be aware of that. And then not to get too far ahead of ourselves. June 5th is the first day of classes for summer session one. July 10th is the first day of classes for summer session two, if you decide to take classes at that time. All right, let's talk a little bit now about academic advising on the next slide. So cars, trains, planes, all things have these redundant systems where if something fails, something else steps in and takes its place. Advising.udal.edu is a place where a whole host of resources are compiled into one place. So that, for example, you can't find a resource somewhere else 
you can probably find it at advising.udell.edu. On this site, you can access calendars and deadlines, schedule an advising appointment, confirm your degree requirements, um, look at grading policies, look at the policies around class attendance and absences, find academic resources and support, and access many other interesting things to help you become a successful student. You should poke around this site before you start school in the spring and bookmark any links that you think will be um, helpful to you. Now let's talk a little bit about advisement, okay? So most of you should have already had an academic advisement appointment, but let's talk about how advisement will happen in the spring in case this hasn't happened for you already. So this spring, as you know, through the application process, you've submitted an application, you send in or you will send in AP or IB uh, coursework and, and scores that you've earned. You might uh, have transfer coursework or dual enrollment coursework. You wanna make sure all that has been submitted to the university. That's because your academic advisor will need to see what you have credit for as together we focus on course selection for spring and the registration process. Our goal is by February 3rd, which is not too far off next week, in fact, to have your spring semester schedules in a final form. That's our goal. It won't happen for 100% of the people on this Zoom, but that is our goal, and we do a very good job of trying to get to that. Now, for this spring, you could meet with an, a faculty advisor, a professional academic advisor. You might meet with staff in an advising center, or maybe a combination of those things. You might or might not meet with your assigned academic advisor for the spring semester. Units typically make advisor assignments very soon if they haven't done so already. So you'll be able to see who your academic advisor is in UDSIS, and there will be a link there so you can contact them via email. Um, these advising meetings that you have could be one or one or in groups or a combination of those too. So our goal is to answer any questions you have about coursework and the registration process at this time. So students, between now and the start of the semester, we wanna make sure you have met your advisor. And if you have already, that's great. But if you haven't, make sure you reach out to them and get on their calendar. Check your college's or unit's module in Canvas for a contact email address. And again, I just wanna remind you, please don't make any changes to your course schedule for spring unless you talk to your academic advisor first and you jointly decide on what changes to make. Now, in future semesters, like the summer or fall of 2023, um, you'll be registering yourself for classes. And so you'll schedule an appointment in advance of your course registration date um, so that you can talk to your advisor about what kind of coursework you need to take in either the summer or the fall um, and any kind of UD resources you might need. Again, course registration and the registration appointment that you get will be based upon your earned credits, all right? Uh, an advising appointment is different from a registration appointment. The advising appointment is when you meet with your advisor. So two different things there and just want to make sure you understand what they are. Let's go to the next slide and talk about your course load for the spring. So a typical course load is between 12 and 15 credits. For those of you who have uh, been in school before, you know that most courses are three credits. It's a reflection of how much instructional time is spent during the week uh, when you're in that class. Um, lab sciences, foreign languages, and some math courses might count for four credits. There's a limited number of one credit courses. Um, so you'll see all that information um, if you look for it. And, and we advise students actually to take around 15 to 16 credits per term. That's to stay on track with your degree requirements. Uh, and it will allow you to graduate in four years. Specifics of that will also be discussed in your Meet Your College session or when you meet with your academic advisor. The undergraduate catalog actually shows suggested four-year plans for every single major. So if you have any questions about what you should be doing at any point in time in terms of your course registration, you can always look there. So I'd like to invite Connor back into the session now. Do you have any comments about typical course load and, and what it's normal to take? 
Yeah, no, I can definitely talk about that. So what I can say for one is that as a student, I know it can be very intimidating, like looking at this and saying, taking five courses a semester, you know, trying to get involved in clubs, trying to make friends, maybe getting a job. Like I know it can seem like it is a ton to juggle and I'm not gonna say it's not, but at the same point, what's really helpful and Chuck already talked about this a lot, but there's a lot of resources on campus to help students succeed when they're taking that course load. So what I can say students is don't be intimidated at the get-go, right? I get that it can be seem like a lot, but it's definitely very manageable. I am someone who I've had jobs, I've been involved in clubs, and I've really been able to still do a lot on campus while taking 15 credits. And I can say that as someone who's about to graduate in the spring, um, it definitely feels really good to know that I was able to graduate in four years, able to kind of meet the goals that I set for myself. So I can say that I think talking with your advisor and coming up with a preferred course load for you is very, very helpful based on your goals. Um, if you were somebody who, you know, maybe you are taking classes that might be harder or maybe that you are worried about meeting that 15 credit per load um, per semester, that is totally okay. Um, we do offer some um, extra sessions, like we have our winter session that is just finishing up, right? So that's about a five week shorter session. So doing that 30 credits a year is still possible but you don't have to necessarily do 15 in the fall, 15 in the spring. Um, your advisor is willing to work with you if you wanted to try to maybe take a class over the summer or take a class over the winter. In that way, maybe if you're taking a really, really hard class, um, you're able to take it just by itself in the winter so you can just focus on that course. Um, there are a lot of different options and that's really what I, want to, what I want to stress here, right? There's a lot of different ways to meet that 30 credits per year to meet your specific goal as a student. And I really encourage you to talk to your advisor. My advisor helped me set out a whole like Excel sheet that planned what classes I was going to take when. I just like seeing it in front of me. I know that's not the same way for everybody, but again, I really encourage you to kind of Think about those goals, talk about them with your advisor because they'll really help you succeed in the long run as you try to balance your course load and balance all the other things you wanna do here on campus. Back to you, Chuck. Thank you. Thanks, Connor. So on the next slide, there's a, a thing that's called Finish in Four Campaign and you may hear about it. There we go. So to graduate in four years, you should enroll as we've been talking about 15, 16 credits per semester and about 30 credits per year. It could be flexible. Maybe you do 14 and 16 or something like that. Um, or 16 and 14. That's just the idea. Finishing in four is kind of a mindset and, and it's about momentum. When you get in your mind that you're going to finish in four and you know you have to take these courses, you're more directed to get them done. And so we really encourage you to do that. We encourage you to maximize the use of your credits during the fall and spring semesters, um, because if you do take winter or summers, that is at an added cost. So you need to understand and know that. So to ensure you're staying on track, meet regularly with your academic advisor and review your degree audit in UDSIS. I'm actually going to give you some more information about what the degree audit is in a, in a future slide. Now, finishing four is mostly a freshman campaign. Um, since we know that uh, there are transfer students here on Zoom, um, you'll likely be done in fewer years than four while you're here. But transfer students, we still want you to work closely with your academic advisor to discuss what transfer credits you have, how they apply to your degree, and how that affects what coursework you need to take uh, here in the spring. So Connor, do you have anything to share about your winter or summer session experiences? Yes, I definitely can. So I kind of alluded to it before, but I have taken a couple of winter session courses. And again, I think it's very helpful because the way I thought about it was I knew I was going to have a really, really busy spring semester. I was working um, two different jobs on campus and I knew that my classes were going to start getting more difficult. Um, as a biology student, I was like dreading taking things like organic chemistry. So I really wanted to have some extra time in my schedule so I could really focus on the things that were important to me. So taking a winter session class really allowed me to have some extra breathing room. I was able to kind of focus on that one class that I took over winter. And then when the time came, the time that I typically used to spend to my fifth class, I was able to kind of distribute to my other four classes and have some more time to be able to do all the things that I enjoyed, but also get the grades that I wanted in my courses. So for me, it was very helpful. Um, I did it two different years. 
But like I said, the other two years, I decided not to do that. And I just went with the normal um, 15 credits per semester course load. I know plenty of people who have either never taken a winter session course. So I have some friends who always just do 15 credits a semester. But I also know people who always take advantage of those special sessions. So there's no right or wrong way to do it. Um, like I just said, it can be very helpful if you, you know, are planning ahead and you might be busy or might have some hard classes. It can definitely give you some more time, but there's no requirement to have to do that, um, especially if you're kind of interested in staying on one same track. So there's no one way to do it. But again, I think talking about your goals with your advisor can help you kind of set up that um, schedule for you. Awesome. Can you continue and tell us a little bit about what students should expect this spring on the next slide? Yes, I can. All right, so kind of talking about expectations for the spring, um, looking at some specific um, things related to campus. So first of all, the first week of classes. So as some of you might be familiar, the first week of classes is really a time to get to know what it's like to be a student and get to know what it's like to be a student in these specific classes. So your professors, they will go over course expectations, they will go over the syllabus, which is the big overview of the entire course. Typically, they'll also lay out things such as um, grading. So maybe like exams are this percentage of your grade. Homework assignments are this percentage of your grade. They also might give you things such as dates for big projects, big assignments. The goal of this is to make sure you know what to expect for the course. The, the professor knows what to expect of you. And it's a really, really great time to kind of ease into your first semester here at the university. And something to help you with that transition is Canvas. So Canvas is a online hub for all of your courses. So you will be able to log on to Canvas and see a list of all of your classes. When you click on them, you can see things such as grades. You can submit and view assignments on Canvas. You can also interact with students. There are some discussion boards and Q&A boxes to do that. But the idea is that it's your one-stop shop for all things academic. You can look at your courses, you can look at your assignments and really know what's to be expected, um, look at calendars. So it's very, very helpful. Um, professors use it a lot here at UD. So it's a really great way to stay on top of your coursework and kind of know what to expect, you know, every given week. Additionally, um, we have some synchronous and asynchronous classes. So if you aren't familiar with that terminology, synchronous means that you are going to that class live, right? So that means that you are either doing it virtually or in person. So your class is from 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. every Monday, Wednesday, Friday. That would be an example of a synchronous class. An asynchronous class is a class that doesn't meet live. So perhaps there are pre-recorded lectures that you watch, or perhaps you don't have any lectures at all. So the important thing is to kind of know the difference between those classes. Synchronous is more structured, whereas asynchronous is more kind of creating your own schedule. Um, classes are offered in different ways. A lot of our classes um, are being offered synchronous, but there are some asynchronous options um, and offerings. So if you are looking for one or the other or concerned about what your class is offering, you can talk to your advisor about that. This is a great transition into office hours with faculty. So office hours, this is a dedicated time in which your professors and your teaching assistants will be in their office and open to answer questions for students. So your professor might say they have their office hours at 11 a.m. every single day. So let's say you have a question about a homework or a question about an upcoming exam. You can go into those office hours and get to know your professor. And a really great opportunity that I always stress for students is that it's not just a time to ask questions about your course. That is really, really helpful and a really great resource to use. But you can also use it to get to know your professor, right? There are people too, um, and a lot of them are really, really interesting. They also have a lot of great connections. So if you're looking to maybe get involved in research, learn more about a field, or just to get to know your professor so you can have a more personal environment in the classroom, go to office hours, right? It's a really great opportunity that I think not enough students make use of. Um, and I know every professor that I've had has specifically said that they love when students come to office hours. So it's a really great time to not only get to know your field, but to get to know the professor themselves. So definitely recommend making use of that. Academic advisement, we've talked a ton about that already, but it's a really, really, really helpful resource. So we always make sure to kind of hammer that point home. But the idea here is that your advisor and what I like to stress at this part is they're more than just someone you talk to before you schedule courses. Of course, that is really, really helpful, right? I think every time before I have scheduled courses, I always make sure to talk to my advisor to make sure that I am on track. But you can also talk to them about things all throughout the semester. If you have a question about 
some logistics for a course, if you have questions about a grading policy, um, anything academic, your advisor is there to talk to you. So if you want to talk to them either at the beginning of the semester, the end of the semester, or anywhere in between, they are a really great resource to help to either guide you to somebody else or to talk to you about your academic needs. And then finally, resources and support. So the big idea here is that there are so many people at the university who are here to support you. Um, there are people such as your assistant deans like um, Chuck, there are people like your academic advisors, and then there's a whole slew of other people both in academic support and outside of it whose full-time job is to support you as a student. So that's super exciting. Just know that if you are struggling in a course or struggling in a different area of your academic life, there's somebody there to support you. So you might not know all those people's names and that's okay because your advisor probably does. So they're a really great place to go if you need any of that extra support or help because really what we wanna hear, what we wanna see from the university is we wanna see you succeed. And um, that's a really important point that we always like to let you guys know. All right, I think that is it. Back to you, Chuck. Yep, thanks, Connor. Let's talk about uh, three of those resources on the next slide that we wanna highlight. One is called the Blue Hen Success. Um, this is a platform where you can make advising and tutoring appointments. So make sure you log into that and take a look at it. And then there, of course, is UDSIS, which I mentioned earlier. On here, you can see your class schedule. It'll talk with you. It actually doesn't talk to you. It will show you when you have course uh, registration appointments, and it will be where you actually get into what's called WebReg, which is our registration program. Uh, you can run what's called a degree audit. I have to talk about this a little bit because I mentioned it earlier. A degree audit is a report that UDSIS can generate for you showing what requirements you have met for your major. So it's a great way to see what you have satisfied or haven't yet satisfied in your degree program. And so before you go in for academic advisement, you should always take a copy of your degree audit with you so your advisor can look at it with you and figure out what you need to take next. There's also something called a what if report. It's like a degree audit, but it's used for students who might be thinking about changing their major. So if you're a mechanical engineering major, but you really wanna change into say uh, um, a chemistry major, you can make yourself look like a chemistry major, run this what if audit, and it'll show you what coursework you have done or what you still need to do for that major. You can also see your unofficial transcript there. An unofficial transcript is simply a semester by semester listing of the courses you've taken and the grades that you've earned. All this information, again, probably going to be covered if it hasn't been already in your Meet Your College session. Uh, but, you know, we have to say things several times in order for it to kind of make it familiar with you. Then there's the undergraduate catalog. In here are academic expectations and policies, requirements for every major, course descriptions, and like I'd mentioned before, the four-year plans, which shows you how to get your degree done. Let's go to the next slide, please. So on one of the slides uh, today, one of the first ones, we discussed how you can be your own best advocate. And this is a really important skill to develop, uh, whether from the standpoint you need help or from the standpoint, you really wanna to try to do better, okay? Um, while we're here to provide support to students, sometimes that consists of teaching students to fish rather than giving them a fish. And if you cast your line here, truth be told, there's plenty of fish to catch. So in classes, for example, you can utilize your professors and teaching assistants, seeing them during office hours um, and things like that. In your college, you of course will be assigned an academic advisor, um, that could be a person like me in an academic advisement office. It, it could be a professor who does academic advising as well. Um, and then at the University of Delaware, there's some other academic support available by a number of different centers and offices. So the Center for Counseling and Student Development is one where if you need mental health counseling uh, or wellness kind of discussions, that's the place to go. And we have an Office of Disability Support Services. This is an office that um, provide service to students with temporary or permanent disabilities. And I should mention now that <clears throat> if you've had accommodations um, in high school or at another institution, you should connect right now with DSS. Well, right not now, but right after the session anyway, okay? Because the accommodation process takes a little time to get into place. Um, let your advisor know if you haven't already that you have already connected with DSS or you plan to connect with DSS so that they know how to help you best. 
as I said, reach out sooner than later, and later meaning later today, okay? Then there's an Office of Academic Enrichment. This is the office that coordinates group uh, and individual tutoring and drop-in tutoring. Um, they have academic skill building courses like University 113, which is a study skills course. They have one-on-one -on -one academic assistance. They have online and in-person type workshops where they will talk with you about time management, study skills, note-taking skills, um, test-taking skills, and goal setting. This is a great office to uh, take advantage of uh, when you're here at the university if you need that kind of help. And there's the University Writing Center. Actually, there's two, one in Kent Hall and the basement level of Memorial Hall. So um, you can actually uh, uh, go there to get help with any kind of the writing assignments that you might have to do. The and more category there would include supports for students like the Language Proficiency Center, the Physics Help Center, and the Center of uh, the Math Sciences Learning Lab, MSLL. Um, so these are places that you can use to get assistance. Connor, um, do you have anything you'd like to add to this uh, slide? Um, the only thing I wanted to say, you kind of talked about um, the Writing Center already, but I really do love the Writing Center. Um, even as an English major, I've gone there before, and I've actually gone there as a student who's getting help for classes that aren't just English classes. So I think that the common misconception is that you can only go there if you're writing a paper for an English class, but sometimes if you're doing a project for a, you know, a science course, or sometimes if you're doing a longer paper for, you know, a class that might not be in that exact purview, you can still get help for those papers. There's a lot of really, really great people who work there and who are really interested in helping students. Um, the best part too is a lot of them are students who have taken the courses that you may currently be taking. So it's very helpful to have kind of that like inside knowledge when you're writing things like that. So I definitely recommend going and getting help because hey, why not? You know, it's help that people wanna help you and make sure your papers are better. But that's all I had to add. Cool, great. All right, let's move to the next slide. So talking about parent and guardian secure services, so the uh, Family and Educational and Privacy Act, FERPA, as you might know it, has been around for a, a good long time, actually since 1974. And so um, we don't send grades home anymore, for example, as a result of this. I used to wait for the envelope to come through the mail and try to be the first one to get it. Uh, maybe somebody, some of you can relate to kind of want being like that as well. But anyway, we don't share grades or financial information with parents or family members um, without their adult student giving us permission to do so. So after this presentation, it might be a good idea to have a discussion about how you as a unit will discuss how you're going to share these things. Now, if a student chooses to share that information, they can go on the registrar's website and there's a place where they can say, share this information with my family or this person. Um, that will then generate an email to that family member who will then have to complete a, a login type thing. Then they should be able to see that information. Um, by the way, just to get more information, an additional plug for signing up for the Blue Hen Hub. Um, that gives information, dates, and deadlines pertaining to grades and finances. And parents and family units and support persons may actually find that useful at this point in time. All right, let's talk about your next step as Blue Hens. First of all, if you haven't already, attend the Meet Your College session and schedule or attend your advising appointment. If you still have questions about your schedule or anything about registration for spring, please make sure you contact your advisor again. Complete the modules in your NSO Canvas course. Um, I really wanna emphasize this fourth bullet. As a UD student, you will get emails from the university from a variety of places in the university every day. So make sure you check your email account daily for important updates. I know as a student, you're gonna be very busy and you're likely to try to, you know, maybe, you know, kind of skip through your emails, which is kind of fine. We all do that to some degree, looking for things that are important, but just make sure you check them to make sure you don't miss something important, okay? Talk with your family about how you're gonna share uh, your academic progress and other information. Um, take some time to explore internships that are available, undergraduate research opportunities, study abroad opportunities that are starting to now open up more um, that the pandemic is in control. Look for clubs and organizations you might be interested in. And just again, another kind of plug for being your best own advocate. Reach out for support early here at the university. Okay, well, next slide, please. This is our thank you slide. 
So we want to thank you for your kind attention today. We know it's a ton of information that you get at sessions like these, and it's a lot to take in. So um, we encourage families and students to utilize the Canvas calendar, uh, Blue Hen Family Hub, um, to get information on everything with dining, financial services, health services, et cetera. Okay. Yeah, I think if we have time, and I'll have to let the uh, Kelly Murrays of the world answer this, do we have time to take any questions today from the chat? We do have time. We actually have a, quite a few questions about how to find your advisor or schedule an appointment. Could you cover that for us, Chuck? Sure. So you can check your Canvas site because all of the colleges uh, have modules in there that will list who advisors are. Um, I know for the College of Engineering, that is definitely in that site. You could also go to Advising Central and navigate to the college that you're in, and then that will take you further down into your departments and lists of advisors are there. Um, their emails will be there. Simply hit the email and, and check that out. You could also go into the Blue Hen Success platform. Um, many uh, colleges and departments will have the advisors listed there. And so you can make an appointment that way as well. So at least three different ways you can do that. And I would just say, do you or Connor have any final tips as students start their um, spring semesters or are transitioning back from World Scholars? Any tips for students as they start? Hmm. Well, I usually approach things as a, a, a former teacher uh, from an academic standpoint. And the, the most successful students in my experience do a couple things. One is um, they check their email daily for important announcements. They do all the reading and their homework that they're supposed to do and don't let it build up. Um, they reach out for help early and often as soon as they know that they need help. If you do those three things, I think you're off on, on the right foot here. Connor, would you add anything to that as a, a student? Well, I definitely think doing your homework is important. Um, but what I would also add is I really encourage you to find at least one other person to support you as a student. That can be another student. That can be, I know for me, I had older siblings who are in college, so that was very helpful for me. But it could also be an advisor or a professor. Just having somebody who you can go to if you need some academic support is really, really helpful because you can go through your degree by yourself, but you don't have to, right? You can always have somebody who can support you and help you um, get through your time at college. So I just recommend finding somebody. Again, your advisor is a really great place to start, but it doesn't have to be them if you have um, other resources and outlets there. So that's really just what I would recommend as a student. I know that's really helped me kind of get through my time here at UD. And I'd like to add too, like if you're going to live in a residence hall, you're going to have an entire residence hall staff to support you. Resident assistants on your floor, a residence hall director who is uh, knows a lot about the university and how you can get help. So you can tap into those folks as well. I also just want to add for students, there's a great opportunity your first week of classes to attend um, spring 1743 welcome days, which is a time for you really to get acclimated to campus, learn about different resources, um, engage in some different opportunities. So that schedule um, is posted on the UD Connect app. If you haven't downloaded that app yet, um, you should as you start your coursework, but um, there's a lot of great things happening the first week of classes that you won't wanna miss. So um, I will turn it back over to Connor and then um, we've got some further instructions about our student session. Alrighty, well, thank you so much, Kelly. And thank you so much, Chuck, for such a great academic life presentation. We really, really appreciate your support. Oh, my pleasure, thank you. All right, everybody. So we have a little bit of time for our next part of the program begins, um, but you'll see here on the screen real quick, it'll change and you'll see the student Zoom link. So students, um, this is the link that you have for the Zoom to join with your orientation leaders. So this will start in about five or so minutes. So students, you are able to log on to this Zoom link. Important point is that make sure you are logged into Zoom with your UD credentials. So that would be your UD username and your UD password. Um, if you're not logged in, you may have issues getting into the system. So if you have issues logging in, just make sure to check that first. Make sure to check that you are logged in with your UD credentials. Um, but family members and guests, you will stay here because once the student session begins in about five minutes, we will start our student life session right in the Zoom. So you can just sit tight.
And if you have questions, um, orientation staff will be here. We'll be checking our email. We'll be more than happy to support you if you have any tech issues. We want to make sure you can get into your Zoom session and meet your orientation leaders. All right, well, just one more reminder. Um, if you are a student still in this session, um, we did post the student Zoom link in the chat, so you're able to join right there. But if you need other support, again, you can just contact NSO staff and we're more than happy to help you. But with that, we're going to move on to our student life session. We have the wonderful Adam Cantley, the Dean of Students. So you can take it away, Adam. Hello, uh, families. Uh... It's great to speak to families because uh, listening to that acoustic version of time after time, it just made me think of Roe Michelle's high school reunion. And at least there may be some people in the room that would get that reference versus when I meet with students and make a reference like that, they would just look at me uh, like I was an alien and have no idea what I was talking about. But that's all I could think about while I was listening to the music play during the break. Um, Connor, thanks for the introduction. And as Connor said, if you are a student, you should be in the student session. Uh, give a shout in the question answer chat area um, and Connor will help you uh, 
um, navigate over there or a member of our uh, NSO team will gladly assist. So as Connor said, my name is Adam Cantley. I'm Dean of Students and Assistant Vice President for Student Support and Advocacy here at the University of Delaware. I have been um, at UD, this is my 12th academic year here, um, and we are excited to welcome you all um, to the university. Some of you are coming to us after spending some time abroad with our World Scholars Program. Some of you are transfer students. Some of you are new student families. We have a, a wide variety of folks. Um, so excited to welcome you all to UD for our spring semester starting in wow, just uh, less than two weeks now. That's not at all terrifying, but maybe a little bit. But we're excited to have everybody back and um, excited to talk to you all today about student life and um, experiences that happen outside of the classroom for our students and also talk to you a little bit about how um, you can stay connected to the university and best support your student as they start their time here or continue their time with the University of Delaware. Next slide. We always like to start with a, a you did it slide. We know that the journey that your student has been on to get to today, um, you have been there every step of the way supporting, holding hands, drying tears, cheering. Um, so this is a day of celebration for you as they start their time here uh, on campus at the university. Um, and we wanna make sure that we appropriately recognize all the work that you have put into this um, to get here today. And we uh, really thank you. Um, and we appreciate you all trusting us with um, this next step in your students' uh, life. Next slide. So now what? What does this mean? What's going on? What's happening? Um, and I think what we really want to focus on is that at the University of Delaware, we value parent and family engagement. We know that families are partners um, with us and uh, and helping, helping your student be successful at the University of Delaware. Um, I always tell families like, I know that you know more about that human being than I do. So um, if I need help or support, sometimes I may reach out to you because you're going to be better equipped to deal with that than me uh, if I have the ability to do that. So um, we want to make sure that you have resources, opportunities to connect and engage and, and, and support as you're helping your student here at the University of Delaware. We also know research tells us that families um, that support students, students who have supportive families and, and support systems outside of the university are more successful. Um, they, they achieve higher, they do better in classwork. So it's important that um, our students have that network support outside of the university, um, working with them and helping them out. Um, we have uh, an, uh, a staff member that is specifically dedicated to parent and family engagement, that is James Wright. Uh, James is part of our orientation and transition programs office as assistant director. Um, you'll see a lot of James James uh, on the Blue Hen Family Hub that we'll talk about later um, and, and promoting other events that are happening on campus. So um, for more information, you can visit sites.udel.edu slash families um, and get a lot of information there. There's also a dedicated email address that families can write in if they have questions, concerns, and that's just families at udel.edu and somebody will help you um, get you to the right place or, or answer your question. Next slide. So what is the role of a family member at UD? And um, we think that um, as we think about how that evolution has changed for you uh, in your time with your child, we often think about it in terms of um, driving and, and cars. This is our metaphor that, that me and a colleague came up with once. So when we were all small children or when your student was small, um, they depended on you to take them everywhere they needed to go. You put them in the car seat, you buckled them up, they were going where you were wanting to go. If they didn't want to go there, that was too bad because you needed them to go there and you were telling them where they needed to go and what they needed to do. But then as they got older, your students said, I want to play soccer or maybe I want to take Taekwondo or I want to be uh, in the band or take voice lessons. And they started to talk about choices that they wanted to make. And you worked with them and said, okay, let's do these things. You still drove them there. You were still responsible for them. Um, you were helping them figure out you were riding public transportation with them. But then as they got older, maybe they got their driver's license. Maybe they got their own bus pass. Maybe they got whatever they needed to do to get where they needed to be. So you let them drive on their own. They got a little bit more freedom and things like that. They were still checking in. They still had a curfew. If you were like me, when you missed that curfew, you didn't want to come home, but you had to because it was just getting worse the longer you stayed out. Um, but you had all these rules in place. Now, it's different now. And that's not to say that like you're in the trunk or on a roof rack or anything like that. But what we like to say is that at this point, they are in the driver's seat 
and they are setting the direction and they're going to be our primary point of contact when we talk about their experience at the University of Delaware. And families, what we really like to say is you're that GPS in the car with them. You're the one who's giving them guidance from afar a lot of the times. You're helping them course correct. You're the one who's saying, please do a U-turn. Um, and hopefully they're taking that advice, advice, but sometimes they may not, but you're still there supporting them. And as that GPS, our goal at the university is to make sure that you have a wealth of information about what is happening um, so that when they do come to you and ask you for advice, that you are equipped um, to answer those questions and help them get on the right course. And today we're gonna talk a little bit about um, where you can find that information and how the Division of Student Life operates and can be a partner for you. Next slide. So I've said student life. What is that? What is that about? It's not just people being on campus. The Division of Student Life um, is under Vice President Jose Luis Riera. I believe you all saw him this morning in the welcome session. So um, if he shared the Division of Student Life, our mission is really simply to advance equity and inclusion, deepen student learning, and drive holistic development. We know that learning on our campus happens not only in the classroom, but outside of classroom. The co-curricular experience is rich, it's diverse, it is um, deep here at the University of Delaware, and that's where a lot of our work is done. So we're doing things uh, around education, we're providing experiences and creating communities that really help us in achieving those goals of our mission. Our vision is that students, when they come to the University of Delaware, they have an amazing experience that helps them not only thrive here, but gives them skills that they can take with them throughout the rest of their time and their life. Um, so I'll um, talk a little bit more on the next slide uh, about our values and what guides our work and give you some examples. So we have five core values to our work in the Division of Student Life and um, my over 200 plus colleagues that, that are part of the division. One is to amplify student voice. Um, our students, uh, uh, many, uh, many, many are adults, and we know that they have a strong voice and they want to have a, a role in shaping their education. Um, and so we want to amplify that and make sure that we're being responsive to that. One of the great examples I can give of that is our student wellness ambassador program. Our students really um, began using their voice around um, the pandemic, talking about what does it mean to be in a healthy community? How can we support one another um, and let them do that? There was also a Reflections on Change podcast where students um, were the ability to share their stories and what was happening to them and our Blue Hen Leadership Program um, and things of that nature that really amplify our students' voice and, and allow them uh, the opportunity to, to get out there and start to exercise that voice that we hope they will continue to develop and use once they leave UD. Um, pursuing equity is a value for us. We want to remove barriers um, in, in access to student life and access to the university and also uh, encourage intercultural connections. This spring, um, if you're in the Perkins Student Center, you might hear a lot of banging as we finish construction on our intercultural engagement center. Um, I get to go there later today actually and do a walkthrough. I'm very very excited, um, but an opportunity for Blue Hens to come together, uh, connect, talk about difference, talk about um, a lot of great things and, and, and promote that. Transformational collaborations. Um, we believe that no office should be doing anything within a bubble. And that, first of all, new student orientation is a great example of that. You'll hear from folks all across campus, both in student life, outside of student life, really coming together to make sure um, that your student and you are getting a lot of information today to help you um, be prepared. I also think about uh, connections between our residence life and housing staff and our career staff to look at sophomore readiness and in career education. So there's a lot of great examples of how people are coming together to do different things. Um, learning and innovation. I think that if there was ever a value that, that we leaned into more during the pandemic, it was learning and innovation. We had to think about new ways to do things, how to do things differently, creating online communities and opportunities um, where we didn't want to just cancel programs and not have opportunities for people to connect we really worked hard to have different opportunities um, for people to find one another, to, to create community, even when we were apart. It was a really tough time, but our staff really leaned into that learning and innovation to make things happen. And then integrity and respect. Um, that is not only between us as colleagues, but also with students. Examples that I can think about is our community standards and conflict resolution office and how they support students maybe when they have violated policy, but treating them fairly and with respect. Our amnesty program that supports students uh, in the Office of Student Conduct that if there is um, somebody who needs help 
Uh, with drugs or alcohol, we will we want them to get help first, and then we don't need to worry about uh, the conduct piece of that. We never want that to be a barrier to getting help. So respecting that sometimes students do get in situations, but we always want them to get help and not have to worry about getting in trouble. So there's a lot of different ways that these values play out, but that's just a, a couple of examples. Next slide. So this is a list of our departments uh, and partners here at the University of Delaware. I am not going to go over all of these. If you've had experiences um, on college campuses or have had connections on college campuses, a lot of these offices exist across the country and the world. Um, I know that I've worked with some of these folks in our, um, our World Scholar uh, partner in Madrid. I got the opportunity to go there. So these aren't new. These are very much things that exist on, on campus. You can find more about these offices at udel.edu slash student life. That's where all our web space is. You can learn more about the division, the folks that are a part of it, the offices that that, that really activate our work um, and, and are the ones that your students are seeing on a regular basis as they, they uh, navigate our campus. Next slide. So we really wanna take some time to make sure that we talk about the Blue Hen Family Hub. So this is your primary connection point um, to the University of Delaware. At this point, um, you should have received an email invitation to join the Blue Hen Family Hub. If that hasn't happened, it will be coming. If maybe you uh, signed up a little bit later, but you will receive the opportunity. You can also go to udel.edu slash family hub um, to learn more about signing up and, and starting that process. But the Blue Hen Family Hub is a space specifically for families of UD students. That's the only people who can be involved in this space um, to learn about what's happening at the institution and connect to different communities based off what your student is doing on campus and based off your interests. Next slide. So when you log into the Family Hub up in the top right hand corner, um, that is where you will click to build out your profile. This is an opportunity for you to talk about who you are, share what you wanna share, um, and, and really design how you want to be on this space. It is, um, <clears throat> once you've logged in, then you can start to build that out. And then the next step and next slide is to start to build out some of these communities, which are on the left-hand side of the page. There'll be some communities that you are put in by virtue of things that your student um, is doing on campus. For example, residence life and housing. Our students who are, have, uh, our families of students living on campus are put in a residence life and housing community. First year students, you'll be put in those kinds of communities as well. And that helps you get information that's really targeted to your students' experience and what they're doing on campus. So um, there'll be some opportunities to, to have those things that your student is already a part of be pre-built into your experience. Next slide. There's the ability to search posts within um, the Blue Hen Family Hub. So say, hey, I would like more information about um, student financial services. You can put student financial services or what about scholarships? Scholarships, and it's gonna populate anything that exists regardless of community on the Blue Hen Family Hub and pull that in a search for you. So um, the way that it works is our staff and faculty and other folks are pushing content to this, reminders about things that parents need to do, need to know, um, things that students need to know, important events, ways to connect to UD. So there's a lot of different ways that, that folks are putting information on here. And sometimes it can be overwhelming. So if you just wanna curate, hey, what's going on? Is there something about scholarships? I can type in scholarships and what will pop up will pop up. Next slide. So the communities piece is great because yes, you'll be put in ones that are um, for you um, and that your students doing, but maybe you would like to learn more about athletics. So you can click that discovers communities button um, and get the opportunity to browse all the different communities that exist at UD. Maybe your student isn't into athletics, but you wanna come cheer on the Blue Hens, you want more information about what's going on, um, you can add yourself to that community. So there's a lot of different communities that exist um, across uh, the university that, that you can be a part of. And so don't think that you just have to stay the ones that you're assigned in, you can definitely check out and see what's going on in other parts of the campus. Next slide. Lastly is this calendar of events. So um, I always joke, <laughs> if your student calls you and says, nothing's happening today, I'm so bored, 
first of all, tell them to go study. That's always a good answer. But two, there is always something happening at the University of Delaware. It is a very vibrant campus. Um, there are always programs, always events. Um, but that calendar of events um, populates from the UD events calendar. So as things are shared to that, um, that is getting put in there. So you have the ability to kind of see what's going on campus. So when they call you and say, I'm bored, nothing's going on, just say, give me two minutes, log in, calendar events. You can say, these things are happening. And if you don't want to do any of that, the library is in fact open for you right now. Um, so there's always something going on and always something that you can learn about that's happening at UD. And a lot of these are open to the public um, and to families. So if you're in the area, there might be something that you want to check out. Next slide. So let's talk about some other resources for you. Um, we talked about the Office of the Dean of Students and um, that's where I work. We work um, with orientation and transition programs uh, around the families at udel.edu uh, um, or emails to help uh, get those questions answered. So we are definitely a resource for you. You Daily is uh, exactly what it sounds like, a daily news update and stories from the University of Delaware. So. Uh, a lot of great stories about things that students are doing, research that faculty is doing, um, neat community programs, a lot of really um, ways of talking about how UD and individuals at UD are making an impact or changing what's happening on campus. So there is an opportunity to, to definitely um, get some daily UD news in your life if you're very interested in that. There is a closed parents Facebook group for UD parents and families. So this is the official one that our colleagues and communications and marketing are working with, pushing information to. Um, you can go to that link um, and be a part of that. As I said, there will be plenty of unofficial Facebook groups that exist for parents and families, but this is the one that UD um, is responding to. Other folks on staff are putting information to um, if you are on Facebook. So there is one official Facebook group. You definitely wanna be a part of that to make sure that, that you are um, getting that information. We're gonna talk a lot about the family guiding calendar here in a bit. So I'm gonna gloss over that. You should be getting that in the mail. Um, if it hasn't come, it will be coming soon. Um, the parent family guide and calendar has a lot of great information that we'll go over. Um, our parent family leadership council is an opportunity for families who wanna get involved um, in the philanthropy uh, of the institution um, and, and being able to give back and talk about active programs that are happening at the University of Delaware. Um, we'll also talk a little bit about it later and I'll give more information. And then Parents and Family Weekend. I love that this says dates coming soon. And um, I say that as I look to my other screen here to the right, because I received an announcement from uh, our colleagues in athletics that says that Parent and Family Weekend dates will be announced at 10 a.m. today in a press release. So I feel that it is after 10 a.m. so that I can tell you, watch me get in trouble for this, um, that Parent and Family Weekend will be um, the weekend of October 7th. If it's in a press release that went out at 10 a.m., I feel confident that I can say it at 10, 19, that it will be um, October 7th. So we will start putting that out in, um, in, uh, in on the Family Hub, broadly to campus, things like that. But you're the first group, I think, to officially know um, since uh, athletics gave us the go ahead. So that weekend of October 7th will be, uh, there'll be the football game. There'll be opportunities for you to connect with faculty and staff, uh, opportunities to connect with other families and really get a taste of what uh, that experience is like for your student um, in October. Next slide. So the family guide and calendar, you should have gotten this in the mail or you should be getting this in the mail soon. Um, we used to do a family guide and it was kind of a booklet um, and it had a lot of great information, but in talking to families, they were like, when do I apply this information or when should I know about this? And so we flipped the format to really make this calendar um, and information guide. Um, it has tips that are ready prepared for each month, different conversations that you can start with students um, and ways for you to engage with campus and know what is going on. Next slide. So this is an example of just kind of what it looks like a blank calendar. But as I said, on the left, there's always tips that's like, okay, back to class, encourage your student to do this. There's always little sub things on the bottom right there talking about different resources. It also, this one doesn't have it on this, but it highlights the um, days like our drop ad deadline or withdraw deadline, or when you need to submit uh, paperwork for 
commencement, like things like that that are built into the academic calendar um, are built into this resource guide once the, the calendar for the year is finalized. So um, you will be see, receiving one. It will be good through the end of this academic year um, and has a lot of great tips uh, and a lot of great resources. There's a, a lot of information throughout that whole calendar um, that I would say if you if you didn't get one in the uh, earlier um, due to maybe being a world scholar, if they was were sent to you already, if you're a new family member, look back in those previous months, uh, or if you're a transfer student, there's still information um, from August to December that you can definitely uh, glean and, and think about for your students. So you should be getting that in the mail if it hasn't already made it to you. Next slide. So I said I would highlight a little bit about our Office of Parent and Family Giving. The Parents Fund, what I love about it, and uh, as somebody who um, has seen the benefits through the work that it's done on our campus. Um, it's a way for parents and family to give directly to UD. Um, and that money goes immediately is cycled right back into student programming and, and, and programs that support students and families currently. It helps a lot with parent and family weekend and some of the extra costs. It also does things around mental health and well-being resource, uh, resources, a lot of leadership development, career development, supporting internships for students. Um, helping with food and housing insecurity and the student crisis fund. So there's a lot of different ways um, that the parents fund gives back. Um, so definitely check that out. Um, the email or the website is down there at the bottom udel.edu slash parents fund. Um, it is an exciting uh, way to if you are passionate about this or enjoy this type of work to give back to current students at the University of Delaware. Next slide. All right, so you've heard me speak enough. I'm going to bring back the myth, the legend, the man, Connor Holm, um, to talk a little bit about his relationship and how he navigated his time uh, with his parents uh, at the University of Delaware as a student. Connor, take it away. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction, Adam. But yeah, but yeah, I can talk about um, kind of my, how I kind of navigated this relationship with um, my family members as I came to college. So as I mentioned in my introduction, I'm actually from Pennsylvania. So I'm about an hour north of campus. So for me, it was very exciting to come to UD because I was about an hour from home. So it was close enough that I could still visit on weekends if I wanted to, but far enough away that I knew nobody was going to like drop in on me unannounced. So it was a very nice distance for me, but it was also the first time I was, you know, home and or away from home and independent. So for me, what really, really helped was communicating. And I know it may seem very simple, but it was very helpful for me to sit down with my parents and be like, hey, let's set some expectations for, you know, how we want to communicate, how often do we want to communicate and how do we want to go about that? And what me and my parents really find finally ended up on was we FaceTime once a week on the weekends. So we'll FaceTime for like an hour. I'll talk about my week. They'll talk about their week and we'll catch each other up on kind of the things going on in our lives. And for us, that really, really works because I know exactly, all right, it's Saturday. Let me, you know, contact my parents and ask them when they're free. And when we find a time. Um, it's very helpful because we have a time blocked out which we can communicate um and that's just helpful because you know i'm busy i really do want to talk to them i really do want to hear about what's going on in their lives and share what's going on in mine but during the week i have class i have clubs i have work so it's very helpful to have those expectations set out so we know when we're going to communicate when we're going to talk and everybody might have different expectations, right? I know people who talk to their parents almost every single day. I know people who are like, yeah, you know what? I don't know the last time I talked to my family members. You know, it's been a while. And that's okay, right? It's different for everybody. Everybody kind of navigates that in a different way. But I think the most important thing is having that conversation because you can set up expectations. Because from my experience, it's when those expectations are misaligned that people get confused, people just randomly call you. And I know for me, if I randomly get a call from one of my parents, I'll like start freaking out and be like, oh my gosh, what happened? So it's very helpful to have those expectations laid out. And I know my situation is also not super indicative of what everybody goes through. I know it's pretty unusual to have the student actually say, hey, let's talk about this. So. I really encourage you as the support system for your student to sit them down and be like, hello, listen, I'm going to have this conversation because they might not be super forthcoming. But again, I think it's very helpful because it's not just for you and your schedule, it's also for their schedule, right? Like I said, when you're on campus, you have a lot going on, but the important thing is that you do still talk to those who are important to you because 
listen, I have a lot of friends and a lot of support systems here at school, but there's nothing like getting to talk to my family and my siblings and my parents. Um, it is really, really important. And I do really value that connection. And I'm sure that your students do as well. So again, I think having that conversation is really important because I know for me, it kind of prevented a lot of headaches and a lot of problems by having those things aligned. Though my mom did text me the other day and say, hey, you haven't talked to me in two weeks. We need to talk. So um, sometimes, you know, there's a little bit of like wiggle room, um, but it is important to keep those expectations up. Back to you, Adam. Thanks, Connor. And just so you know, uh, the random calls still freak you out uh, in the middle of the day um, uh, uh, when you're a much older adult. I got a call from my mom yesterday at one o'clock. I'm in a meeting and I was like, oh, my gosh, my mom's calling me. Is everything OK? And I walk out and I'm like, hey, mom, is everything all right? She says, oh, yeah, what summer did we go to Colorado Springs? I was like, 2011, I'm at work. I'll call you later. <laughs> so uh, that still happens and it will still freak you out in the middle of the day. Um, so I appreciate uh, folks' time today. We have time for questions and I'll turn it over to Kelly Connor and, and the crew uh, if they have any questions or things that they would like me to uh, highlight or put back out there, so. use a little question and answer feature. If not, that's also okay too. If you're not sure how to submit a question today, I do encourage you to um, look at the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen um, and or ask via the chat. Um, but right now, Adam, is there any, you know, I asked this question to Chuck and Connor before, but I think, um, is there anything families can really help prepare their students socially as they transition? Mm to campus this spring? Yeah, I mean, I think that that's part of a college experience is finding that community of people um, that, that you um, need to find. I really think talking to your students about making um, friends that you connect with, not friends of convenience. Um, every year we'll have students who will come into the office of the Dean of Students office. It'll be week one, two, and they're like, I just, I can't find anybody, I'm super lonely everybody on my floor is best friends. And we sit and we talk about student, we learn about what their kind of interests are, help them get connected to registered student organizations. Um, but then they'll usually come in two weeks later and they're like, oh, I found my people. We both love these kinds of things. I'm like, how are all those people doing that we're best friends? Oh, they all hate each other now um, because people were just finding friends of convenience and not really um, because they were so nervous about finding a friend and making that happen quickly that they didn't realize that they still need to find friends the same way that they did people that they have connections with people that they share values with so it will happen and if your students struggling yes we we can help them get connected to supports resources communities that they maybe already enjoy but let them know it's completely normal um, you didn't make your best friend when you were in high school in the matter of a week you're not going to make your best friend when you're in college in the matter of a week um, so don't put too much pressure on finding those people very quickly Yeah, and something I can add to that, I mean, I can say for one, I definitely agree with everything that Adam was saying there. Um, and something I think that's helpful to meet people who are people who you actually, you know, share interests with and really get along with is um, joining clubs and other organizations. And a really great way to do that is we have our spring involvement fair that's going to be during our 1743 welcome days that we have. Um, and this is a really great way to, you know, see all the different clubs and organizations on campus. Um, and what I really recommend is, especially if you're a student who's like starting out, you don't know what your interests are, sign up for literally as many clubs as you want, right? If you want to sign up for one, if you want to sign up for 10, you can. There's no obligation, right? It's not like you're signing a contract and you have to go to every single club meeting every single week. You can have a club that maybe, hey, you start out with this club, but you start to transition to this other one. And then you have that one club that you go to every week because, you know, you meet a lot of really great people in it. Um, but whatever that works out for you, you know, there's no right or wrong, wrong way to do it. But I think that getting your name on an email list, kind of getting the information is that first step. And then once you go, maybe you'll meet those friends and you have a really great interest in the same thing, right? Maybe you absolutely love um, theater, right? I'm a part of a theater group here on campus, which is a really great way to connect to people. Um, but maybe you're part of a sports team or anything in between. So I really recommend signing up for clubs and just at least trying them out because you never know, maybe you'll meet a really, really great friend at one of these meetings. Um, and if you don't, that's okay too, right? You don't have to continue going to that club. So I think the um, joining clubs is a really great way. And again, that um, resource, or I should say the involvement fair is a really, really great time to kind of get to see all those organizations. 
Great. Well, I want to say thank you to you both. Um, I think this has given a lot of food for thought for our families. Um, and I just want to mention that we will have a student Q&A portion at the end of our session um, and program together today. So start thinking of some questions that you can ask students about their own transition, Connor being one of them. Um, and we will get started with our health and well-being portion of our presentation um, at 1035. So I wanted to make sure that you could stand up and stretch refill your coffee or get a snack. Um, so we will return in four minutes and get started with our health and well-being session. Thanks. everybody. My name is Helen Ann Lawless. I'm the Director of Strategic Wellbeing and Training at the University of Delaware, and I'm really excited uh, to share a little bit more uh, with you about all of the amazing health and well-being resources that we have on campus for 
uh, your students. So um, if we were usually doing this presentation uh, in person, I uh, would kind of ask for a show of hands saying, um, you know, throughout your young person's life, uh, how many of you helped them, uh, you know, schedule all of their health related appointments and obviously the, the room would have a bunch of hands go up and I would also ask how many of you even to this day are still scheduling all of their health and well-being appointments and people would laugh and still a lot of hands a lot of the same hands would still go up um, and are also driving them maybe to those appointments as well um, even though they might be licensed drivers um, so one I just want to start by saying thank you so much for all of the work and support that you have done to keep your student well and healthy throughout their life and to advocate on their behalf um, throughout while they navigated the healthcare system um, since they were very young and up, up through this point. Um, and really, this is a this is a big shift from uh, what their experience has been like in healthcare up until now, because when they're on UD's campus and they're navigating our resources, they are for the most part going to be doing that by themselves and maybe for the first time. Uh, and so we really wanna make sure that you all are aware of the resources and the systems that we have in place so you can help maybe coach up or educate um, your student. And they're also in their uh, version of this uh, presentation are also gonna be getting a lot of the same information. Uh, so really good talking points, conversation starters for you to ask your student, um, you know, what do you think about this? What uh, resources might you access? How do you think you will do that? And how will you stay accountable to um, the appointments that you schedule or making sure that you reach out for help and all that good, uh, good stuff. So um, with that, if we could go to the next slide, just to kick off our conversation um, and give you a little bit of an overview of what we're gonna talk about, uh, we are gonna share a little bit about all the work that the Student Wellbeing Portfolio does. And um, just to share a little bit more about those units, it's made up of three units that you see here uh, in, represented by these circles. Uh, student health services, which is uh, what you would think of as your primary care provider or what the work that you would find and support that you would find at an urgent care. Um, then there's the Center for Counseling and Student Development, uh, which is the uh, campus's primary mental health provider. And finally, Student Wellness and Health Promotion, um, which takes more of a holistic preventative approach to well-being and provides some really other uh, important direct services as well for victim advocacy and alcohol and substance use. Uh, and I am joined by some really wonderful colleagues from each of these units and you'll be uh, meeting them in, in just a few short moments, but um, I just wanna give you a, a few other quick pointers of information before handing it over to those folks. Um, so if you go to the next slide, please. It's really important too on a campus as large as ours uh, that we educate students and their families about where to find us and how to get to us. So we've created this map and this tool to uh, help visualize campus for students and where we are located in, in reference to some uh, hot spots on campus. So that uh, light blue circle uh, in the lower, um, the in the lower part of the map is the fountain. That's a pretty central, highly recognizable part of campus. And if you're standing at the fountain and you're looking down the South Green with the library on your right hand side, that's Laurel Hall. Um, that's where Student Health Services is located. And then that last building on the right hand side is War the Wellbeing Center at Warner Hall. This is a newly renovated facility um, and it now houses Student Wellness and Health Promotion as well as the Center for Counseling and Student Development. Um, and I think this renovation and um, bringing all of our uh, well-being offices and units into one centralized location on campus really is demonstrating the university's commitment to well-being and supporting your students. So we really want this to be a one-stop shop for, for your student. We know that physical health and mental health and their social well-being are all inextricably linked, and we wanted to represent that in the way that we were physically located on campus as well. Next slide. Just to give you a sneak peek, knowing that you, you might not be able to make it to campus before uh, your student starts, uh, here is a little bit more, uh, or pictures of the our physical locations, what you'll find inside Laurel Hall, as well as the amazing healthcare providers that your student would be interacting with. Uh, next slide, please. And then you can also see a little bit more about uh, the Wellbeing Center at Warner Hall, where we have 
uh, some really great community rooms where there are a bunch of different amazing activities centered on well-being and educating uh, your student about the different skills that we want to instill uh, in them to help maintain their well-being, not only during their time at the university, but also well beyond that as well. So we have weekly yoga nights, there's a meditation and mindfulness space, we have a very small movement room just to get people curious about exercise, um, and lots of opportunities for uh, group counseling, group meetings, meetings even with well-being related RSOs, um, and an opportunity to interact with our service providers as well. Next slide. Just to uh, you know, share a little bit more about all of the wonderful services that you're about to hear, many of, and I would say even the vast majority of the services that we're gonna be talking about and sharing with you today are covered by the well-being fee that's included in the tuition that all full-time students pay. So if you have a full-time student, the vast majority of the services that we offer come at no additional cost to them. Uh, and I will say part-time students are able to opt into that fee uh, and there are, you know, basically we're going to make sure that if your student is coming to us and they are in need of some support and services, um, we're going to help them navigate that if for whatever reason their well-being fee is not uh, showing up on, on our end. Um, so with that, I am going to turn it over uh, to my colleague from the Counseling Center and I'm also going to try and drop a link uh, with more information about um, the, the well-being fee and other pieces about that in case you're curious to learn more. So next slide, please. Hello, folks, just waiting for the video to come online. Hi. All right. Uh, it's a privilege to be meeting with everybody today, parents, students. Um, my name is Dr. Kelly Zimbella, and I've been at the Counseling Center for about 14 years. I'm going to be talking to you today about our Counseling Center services for this segment. Um, just so you're, so you're aware, clearly, I think um, mental health and well-being are really an important focus all across campus. Um, the Student Counseling Center um, is the primary mental health agency on campus, um, and we are located on the second floor of Warner Hall. Um, as far as our services, students, students uh, seek out our services for a whole range of reasons, from uh, normal events that are incredibly stressful, normal developmental challenges, to sometimes more serious mental health concerns that might arise um, especially amongst college age groups. This is a prime time for mental health concerns sometimes to, uh, to pop up. Um, also, uh, as you can see, you know, we offer a range of services, uh, individual counseling, group counseling offerings, um, and our hours are typically from eight to five, Monday through Friday, and we will have some evening hours that are to be determined. Um, aside from our in-person in services, we also offer some virtual services. Um, that uh, through what we call timely care. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about what to expect. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? Okay, uh, so in terms of what to expect, um, when students um, initially seek out our services, the first entry point is to seek out a triage appointment. Um, the, good, the good thing about triage appointments is that students can just drop in. They don't have to make an appointment in advance. Um, and there can be a, a little bit of a wait time um, so we do ask students to save about an hour to an hour and a half to be able to pop in just in case that there's somebody that maybe got here first and has, um, uh, you know, more pressing concerns because we do uh, have to triage folks. Um, our counseling tends, the work we do with students tends to be short term and goal directed when it's in person. Um, and uh, we find that some students might need referral off campus to uh, who present with, uh, you know, maybe a history of more chronic mental health concerns, or maybe they need a specialist, just like we might need if we go to our primary care doctor and see, oh, I need to see a specialist. The same thing is true in mental health concerns. Um, we do have a referral coordinator that helps connect students to providers off campus. Um, and for that reason, you know, we are familiar with all the insurances that students typically have, especially the student health insurance. Students do get referred off. There's a, a small copay that they would have to pay that's typically around $20. Um, let's go to the next slide, please. Um, so 
other something else students can expect, um, you know, students have access also to a referral coordinator or what we call care coordinator um, at any point, um, but especially if they do need to be referred off campus. Um, and um, we find that, that it is important to have somebody in that role because we want to make sure students don't fall through the gap. Um, another service that we have offered uh, just started this year is called Timely Care, which is kind of an on-demand um, virtual counseling option. Um, in that regard, students can just uh, download a QR code and connect directly to somebody that will get them started with virtual services. Um, they don't have to come through the counseling center for that. Um, we also have, uh, you know, under, uh, you know, emergency counseling services, we also have our UD helpline, which runs 24 seven and um, students can get immediate support uh, it, it, with that option. Um, that said, let's see if there's anything else I want to make sure I cover here. One more thing to mention, um, because some students, many of our students do come from out of state. Um, we do find that sometimes students from New York or Connecticut or New Jersey um, uh, it's really probably about maybe 5% of the time that we find that their insurance doesn't necessarily cover uh, uh, good mental health care in the state of Delaware. Um, if you know in advance that your student may have some mental health needs, it might be worth checking with your insurance company in advance if they're going to be here uh, to make sure that they can get the mental health coverage that they need. Um, next slide, please. And um, so I think this slide kind of speaks to that. Our, our care coordinator will certainly assist through that whole process, especially um, because we just don't want students to be alone navigating uh, these uh, concerns around getting connected off campus. And parents are, are typically pretty far away. Um, so we have a good relationship with providers in the community and no good referral sources uh, to connect students. Um, next slide, please, just to highlight the, the free virtual care that we offer in terms of timely care. This is an example of a poster that might be available on campus. Um, if you want to take a picture of this, if that's possible, um, you can do that. Um, but this sh uh, should be marketed pretty broadly um, for students. Um, and that's about it on my end. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kelly. And uh, now I'm going to turn it over to our colleagues in Student Health Services. Next slide, please. Good morning. Thanks, Helen Ann. Uh, my name is Dr. Kelly Frick. I'm the Interim Medical Director at Student Health Services, and I apologize for my voice. I uh, lost it earlier this week and haven't found it back yet. So Student Health Services is your student's uh, primary medical provider while they're here at UD. And we have a large team of nine physicians, four nurse practitioners, about 29 nurses uh, here all to provide care for your student. We offer routine physics like physicals, uh, chronic disease management for things like asthma, diabetes, thyroid conditions, acne, uh, as well as sick visits and, and injury visits um, also. We have a wide array of sexual health services, including everything from SDI testing to prep for HIV prevention, cervical cancer screening, uh, birth control, uh, and much more. We have a lab on site that performs testing uh, in conjunction with an office visit. So if your student needs a strep test, flu, COVID, mono, uh, blood count, uh, urinalysis, pregnancy tests, uh, and a lot more, uh, we do those right here on site. Um, our lab will also draw samples to be sent to a reference lab like LabCorp or Quest um, for any additional tests that your student might need. So if they need a cholesterol panel, or a kidney test, a thyroid level, anything like that, we would uh, send those to a reference lab like LabCorp or Quest. Um, your student can also bring a lab slip from an outside provider and have their lab work drawn here at Student Health. So if they see their doctor at home or a specialist and they need to have lab work done, they can bring that script here to Student Health, have the labs drawn, and then the results would be sent to the ordering provider. We have an x-ray on site as well. We also have nutrition counseling. And our nutritionists help students with everything from kind of general healthy eating guidelines to uh, managing food options on campus in the dining halls, uh, as well as more medically related uh, nutrition counseling for things like irritable bowel syndrome, diabetes, uh, hypertension, uh, celiac disease, any, anything where nutrition plays a role in uh, that medical condition. Uh, we have travel consults, so travel medicine services for students traveling internationally, whether that's with an official study abroad program or perhaps on their own. We have a large immunization and allergy clinic where we offer all routine vaccines, including travel vaccines like yellow fever and typhoid vaccine. We have a dispensary on site as well, which we'll talk more about shortly. 
We also have sports medicine clinics. So sports medicine services are available for all of our students. Our NCAA athletes um, receive their care at the Whitney Athletic Center, which is uh, down by the football stadium. And it's important to note that all the services listed here on the student health page uh, are covered by the well-being fee uh, that all full time students pay, as Helen Ann mentioned. The only services that may uh, incur an, an extra cost where we typically bill through insurance would be uh, x-rays, lab specimens that are sent to a reference lab like lab or quest, um, vaccine products, so the actual vaccine product itself, uh, and prescription medications. Uh, all our other services, all of our visits with providers, with physicians, nurse practitioners, nutritionists, uh, all those visits do not have any copay and do not get billed through your insurance. Next slide, please. So what immunizations are required? This is probably the, the question that we get asked the most. Um, the QR code that's on the right-hand side of that screen will take you directly to the web page that has all of this information as well. So the required immunizations for all UD students are two measles, mumps, and rubella, or MMR vaccines, one dose of a meningitis ACWY vaccine, and the, the brand names of this type of meningitis vaccine are Menactra, Menveo, or Menquadvi. We do require one dose to have been received after the age of 16. Just a little bit of a note about meningitis. There's two different uh, versions of meningitis vaccines out there. There's also a meningitis B vaccine. Uh, meningitis B vaccine is not required. It is recommended, but please ensure that your healthcare provider can sign off uh, and, and um, verify that your student has received the meningitis ACWY vaccine, which covers the more common strains of meningitis here in the United States. In regards to COVID, the university requires students to have received a primary vaccine series, which is typically two shots plus one additional booster when eligible. All students are also required to complete a tuberculosis screening questionnaire. And based on the responses to that questionnaire, if high risk factors are identified, the students will be prompted to submit a tuberculosis test result. All students are um, required to upload their health history. This is everything from their medical conditions to the medications that they take and allergies that they have. It'll also ask things like surgical history, family history, social history. All UD students are also required to upload their insurance information into the UD Health Portal. Uh, all this information, again, is available uh, on a specific web page on our, on our website. And all the information, the vaccine records, the, the screening tests, the health history, any insurance card, everything is submitted through the electronic health portal called the UD Health Portal. And instructions for submission are again on this website. Next slide, please. Some additional frequently asked questions. So we are uh, open Monday through Friday from 8.30 to 5. Uh, we are appointment based. So please encourage your student to give us a call to schedule an appointment uh, or they can schedule an appointment on their UD Health portal. Uh, we do have urgent appointments available. So if someone has a significant injury or, or uh, urgent health concern, so they're having an allergic reaction, they have a laceration, they have a head injury, they're having you know, chest pain, um, those things we have uh, ability to see them more urgently for. Um, student health is open um, during, during the day, as I said, and then we also have an after hours uh, on-call service, which is staffed by nurses with uh, UD physician backup that can help your student uh, with any after hours medical questions, um, can help them determine, you know, what they can take for their symptoms until they can be seen the next day, um, can also kind of give them guidance uh, overnight. Um, does student health offer allergy injections? Yes, we do. Um, so our immunization clinic provides um, Maintenance, maintenance therapy for students receiving allergy injections. We do just require that a student has received at least one dose of an allergy injection at their allergist office before transferring their injections to student health. Um, there's some information on our website, uh, on the student health website, about how to transfer your allergy uh, injection information to student health, as well as the forms that the allergist would, uh, would complete. And then a little bit about insurance. So does a student have to have the UD health insurance to use student health? No. Um, so all students can use student health. Uh, as Helen Ann mentioned, most of what we do here at student health uh, does not involve insurance at all. Most of it is covered by the well-being fee. Um, if your student has an insurance plan that is out of network for us, so uh, we are in network with uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield, Highmark, Aetna, Cigna, and uh, most uh, non-HMO, non-EPO plans. Um, if your student happens to be uh, have an insurance that's out of network, if they would have a service that would bill insurance, and again, those are, those are fairly infrequent, um, we would bill their student account and provide them a receipt that they could then uh, submit to their insurance for reimbursement. 
Um, there's a link here with a little bit more information about the UD Health Insurance Plan. This is offered to all students. It's through Aetna. Um, it's a very comprehensive plan. So as Kelly mentioned, if you have a student who has chronic health needs and you have an insurance plan that, that you think may not have good coverage in the area, we really encourage you to explore and compare uh, your current insurance plan with the UD insurance plan to ensure that your student has good resources for them in the area. Next slide, please. Uh, we talked a little bit about the, the dispensary. So we have a dispensary on site that has a lot of over-the-counter medications, everything from Tylenol, ibuprofen, Mucinex, basically cough and cold medicines. Uh, we have allergy medicines, uh, cortisone, topical antibiotics, plan B, of course, uh, monostat for yeast infections, and lots of other things. Uh, we have medical supplies, so thermometers, uh, pulse oximeters, and peak flows for our asthmatic students. Those are probably the most popular ones. And then we do offer a, a limited supply of prescription medications. So things like antibiotics, antivirals, uh, inhalers, prednisone, creams, anti-inflammatory medicines, acne medicines, birth control, that sort of thing. It's important to note that because we are a dispensary, we can only dispense prescriptions that are written by a UD provider. So either by a physician or nurse practitioner at Student Health, a psychiatrist at the counseling center, or a sports medicine provider at the sports medicine clinic. If your student has a prescription from their uh, off-campus doctor, so from a, their primary care doctor or a specialist that's off-campus, um, they would want to send that then to either Walgreens, Rite Aid, CVS, or another local pharmacy that's close to campus. Next slide, please. And finally, just a little bit of the words about if your student does have a chronic health condition, whether this is a, a medical condition, mental health condition, really anything that they see a, a provider for on a regular basis. So you wanna make sure that they have a transition plan with that provider from home. So are they going to continue to see that provider? Are they gonna go home every three months to see that provider? Or are they gonna transition their care either to someone at Student Health or the Counseling Center or to a specialist in the community around campus? Um, we do ask that your student bring a supply of medications with them. Um, and depending on your insurance and depending on the pharmacies that are in network for you, uh, you may need to continue to fill that medication at their uh, pharmacy at home uh, and figure out how to get that medication to your student if it's a three-month medication. We do have a website about transition of care, um, so I encourage you to check out that website if you have a student who fits into that category. Um, and again, I would encourage you to explore the insurance coverage options if you have uh, a, a non, um, non, the non-UD insurance plan, particularly if you have an HMO or an EPO uh, or have kind of a restricted insurance plan through your employer. We do have students who um, you know, obviously come from all over the country, and we have students that uh, whose parents' insurance plans are very good, but only for their local area, and they don't have a lot of out-of-state provider options, um, including out-of-state lab, lab, um, lab options or, or specialist options, so we do encourage you to check that out before you make a decision about uh, if your student is going to enroll into the UD insurance plan, and I'll turn it over to, I believe, Matt from Health Promotion. Thank you, Kelly. Good morning, everybody. My name is Matt McMahon. I'm the Assistant Director for Health Promotion and Peer Education at Student Wellness and Health Promotion. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, at Student Wellness and Health Promotion, uh, I like to think of our work being centered around behavioral health. It's so really thinking about the behaviors and the actions and choices uh, that impact your student's health, but also the behaviors and choices that your students make that can have an impact on their peers and how their peers' behaviors can have an impact on them as well. So really moving beyond the individual uh, and into this uh, idea of community well-being. Um, it's important to understand that our services are safe and private. Um, we're really here to help your student uh, where they are, to meet them where they are in their current journey and development process. Um, our services are uh, here to help support your student's general well-being, maybe help them explore entering into recovery from drugs and alcohol, um, maybe overcoming any challenges that they have associated with substance misuse or any harm that they've experienced due to sexual misconduct. Um, like I said, not, your student won't necessarily just learn about the skills and knowledge they need to improve and maintain their own well-being. They're going to have the opportunity to engage with us in a way that's going to help them uh, give back to the community in ways that will help protect 
the well-being of those around them. So the students are going to have opportunities um, to learn how to put their values into action. The students can stand up for whatever they believe in in the way that makes sense for them. Um, we like to call it being an active or a pro-social bystander. So if they see or hear someone doing something that goes against their values or could potentially harm someone, they're going to learn how to step in and protect themselves and their peers from being harmed. Uh, one of the behaviors that we really associate with college that has a big impact on a lot of students' well-being is alcohol use. Um, so a lot of the work that we do with your students at Student Models and Health Promotion revolves around substance misuse prevention. Uh, we really want to kind of normalize this idea that not all UD students drink alcohol. Uh, our data shows us that about 70% of incoming students in this year in 2022 do not drink alcohol. They've either abstained within the past month or they're non-drinkers. Uh, so we want to kind of normalize this idea that your student can come here and have a, a wonderful experience and not use substances. Uh, their experience at UD doesn't have to be what they see in the media. Uh, it doesn't have to be what they see in TV and movies. Uh, and so we want to start, have, have, encourage you to have those conversations with them now um, before they come to campus about what kind of relationship with alcohol do you want to have? What, what these choices going to have an impact on your health, your well-being, your academics, your social standing? Um, the hard conversations to have, but if you start having them now, um, you can keep checking in with your students throughout their tenure at UD. Um, but if you take away one thing from us today, or from Student Wellness and Health Promotion, um, it's we know that students don't necessarily always understand or know or remember the resources and support that they have until they need it. Um, so continue to check in with your student around the behaviors and the choices they're making while they're at UD. Um, and if you hear something or see something which you think is concerning, remind them that we exist. Remind them that they can come to Student Wellness and Health Promotion for these private, for these safe resources um, around their behaviors and their choices. We can help kind of evaluate them and get them on a path where they want to be um, so that they can have the health and well-being journey that they want to have. That's kind of how two models in a quick little nutshell. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Matt. And if you could go to the next slide. So just very quickly, and then I'm going to turn it back over to my colleague in the Counseling Center. I, I want to share about two other resources that are really important to your students' overall well-being. So first, the Office of the Dean of Students. I know you heard from uh, Dean Adam Cantley uh, shortly before we started. Uh, their office provides a lot of really essential support, especially for medical leaves of absence, um, a laptop loaner program, if maybe there are some financial concerns or barriers uh, that are preventing your student from accessing the technology that they need for school, and, and basic need support, whether it has to do with uh, food assistance and, um, you know, strengthening food security, and a student crisis fund, again, if financial needs are, are a concern. And we know that, um, according to the American Psychological Association, that over one in three college students struggle to meet basic needs. So we want to um, underscore that this is a very common experience for students to have and to destigmatize that. So we know that, uh, so that they know that we're here to help them, right? Um, and, and it's okay to ask for help uh, in this area as well. Next slide, please. The last thing I wanna share about is disability support services. We may be echoing some messaging that you've heard before, maybe that you're gonna hear later. But this also, again, plays a key role in our students' well-being. We really encourage um, students and their families to connect with D DSS, uh, to register their disability, and uh, really what the power in this is that uh, DSS is able to assist with academic accommodations. Some examples are listed on the, on the screen, including extended deadlines, quiet testing, note takers, and, and many other options that are going to be especially catered and tailored to uh, your student and their given situation. Uh, this really helps change the environment, right? It makes it more inclusive, accessible environment where students can thrive. That's the goal, right? It's not a, a, a leg up or anything like that, but um, it's creating envi an environment that is the most conducive for their success. Um, a lot of times when we think about disabilities, we think about physical disabilities, uh, like maybe um, visual impairments, hearing impairments, uh, mobility impairments, but it's also really important to remember and underscore 
um, that not all disabilities are visible. So there are many mental health conditions that also qualify for as a disability. Um, and if you're not sure, I strongly encourage you to connect with these folks to learn more and to learn about the additional resources that we have for your student. Uh, and with that, next slide, please. Uh, maybe one more. We're gonna jump into easing transitions. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much. And I'm gonna pass it back to Kelly and the Counseling Center for the remainder of our time. Thank you so much. Thanks, Helen Ann. And thanks to the other presenters, Dr. Frick um, and Matt. Um, so it is my pleasure to be meeting with you again. Um, as I mentioned, I'm Dr. Kelly Ozumbella, a staff psychologist in the Counseling Center. Um, I've been working here in the Counseling Center for about 14 years. And I, for about 12 of those years, I provided this uh, session or a version of this session that we're gonna proceed with today. Um, and easing transitions is really targeting, uh, you know, uh, just creating some space in the orientation process for parents to um, learn a little bit about what they might expect from this transition of, uh, especially for student, for parents that are delivering their first student to college. Um, and veteran parents often do benefit a bit as well. Um, and uh, being at spring semester, you know, I assume that we also have a number of parents today who are parents of students that are transferring to UD and perhaps some uh, World Scholar uh, parents um, that uh, their students are coming in uh, to main campus from where they were abroad. So, um, so that said, I wanna welcome folks. Um, and this presentation, you know, what we've done over the years is amassed as much information from the frequently asked questions that parents ask us during this orientation process. Um, so we wanna share some of that wisdom as well as just some practical information in terms of what are common developmental and transition challenges that we observe that, that students typically face. Um, so next slide, please. Okay. Um, so um, preparing for college, when we think about that, uh, you know, I'd like you all to consider as parents um, that you know, this is just yet another example of another transition uh, that your students will be making and that have made perhaps, again, if they're transfer students or um, World Scholar students transitioning. Um, but you know, the, when, you're, when your child or your student started walking and they started exploring the world, that's when this process probably started because that's when they started to explore the world on their own. Um, and this is just another variation of that as they emerge into adulthood um, and specifically into the context of the University of Delaware and college. Even though transfer students may have been to another college or university before or world scholar students have, have been elsewhere, um, there are still gonna be some, some challenges. And we know from the transfer student and, and transition student orientation that um, a new context can be very jarring. Um, so let's go to the next slide, please. So one free, this is really for newbie parents, I think, but one frequently asked question um, you know, that we get from parents to uh, college freshmen, parents dropping off for the first time is kind of like, when should I leave? You know, when, once I drop them off, you know, should I stick around? Um, something to keep in mind is that, you know, and veteran parents know this, is that students are, are typically in a very different mindset when they're stepping away from home for the first time. Um, they're really eager to make, start to make connections. Um, and in fact, that is a necessary process. And the sooner that they have that independence and the stress of that challenge, the sooner they can try to step up to that because making friends and finding a sense of belonging is really critical. Um, and again, the preparation has already begun. So I guess those of you who have, uh, um, uh, well, we'll leave it at that. Let's go to the next slide, please. So with that said, you know, um, and look at this picture here. It's a really nice picture of one of our residence hall rooms. Everything looks nice and organized. You know, our advice to you is just unload, help them set up their room, and then take a picture of it because it's probably never going to look this clean again. Um, and, um, you know, to the points that I was making earlier, it is really important that they can start to, uh, you know, experience the challenge of needing to uh, navigate a new space um, and uh, make those social connections. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, talking about a lot to navigate this year, I'm gonna guess you have already navigated a whole lot to even get to this point. Um, but the, you know, the fact is the way I like to think about it is that um, you know, all transitions are stressful. 
whether they're planned or unplanned. And one of the things that we often realize and that students realize and, and parents um, is that they often underestimate how challenging it's gonna be. And I think that's true, especially for, even for transfer students and, and World Scholar students, because a new context means a whole new different system to try to navigate. Um, and that can be pretty overwhelming. Next slide. So I, I mentioned earlier that I was going to talk a little bit about developmental challenges. And if there are students watching, you know, I think, you know, they might be able to resonate with this, especially transfer students and, and transitioning students uh, from World Scholars. Uh, but these are some of the common challenges, um, homesickness and culture shock. Um, you know, I think World Scholar students might experience kind of like double culture shock, <laughs> um, re-emerging back into, into uh, the United States. Um, um, a person's self-esteem and confidence can get pretty jarred. Um, you know, other common questions have to do with, you know, wanting to make sure that a person is in the right major. Um, and these things take time. And yet there are all of these things here are necessary challenges. The hope is that they're not overwhelming. Um, stress around these areas is not a, a, an, an unhelpful thing because it helps people rise to the occasion until they can master the challenges just like all of you have when you went through these uh, transitions in this stage and phase of life. Um, the thing for them versus you is that while you've na navigated that already, for them, this is all gonna be really new. Let's go to the next slide, please. This is another really common question. Uh, will my student do as well at college as I did in high school? I suppose a variation of this for, for uh, students that have transferred is, will I do as well at UD as I did at the previous school? Or if I didn't do well at the other one, will I do well in this next one? Um, something to keep in mind, I think, unfortunately, uh, colleges can be a place where students for the first time might realize that just because I work hard doesn't mean I'm gonna do well. Uh, unfortunately, life doesn't slice up that way. And um, oftentimes, however, you know, what's true is that they need to adjust or adapt to how they study and, and approach things differently. Um, and for many students, it may be the first time they experience failure or a challenge. Um, and if it's not the first time, um, perhaps it means that maybe it's the first time that they need to approach things differently. Um, but failure is a natural part of learning. Um, we do well when we are able to master things. Something for transfer students, it is, there's a thing called transfer shock, and it's predictable that uh, persons who transfers typically first semester students often have a lower GPA. That's not the case for everybody, but um, the good news is, is that by the next semester, students' GPAs tend to bounce back um, for the most part. We do have lots of service available for students to um, navigate that extra stress if you're in those categories. Next slide, please. Um, I did mention transfer shock. Here's, here's uh, an example of what transfer shock can look like and relearning. Um, you know, UD is a specific size. You know, it's a, it's a pretty big institution compared to perhaps some of the institutions other students have transferred from. Um, the, just the culture here is different. Uh, there may be new social, new personal demands, as well as many new opportunities, different type of faculty. So let's not underestimate these challenges and we need to make room for understanding that these will cause a, a degree of uh, need for relearning. Next slide, please. Okay. So something that I like parents to think about and students as well, that typically um, when students go away to college, at no time has a door to their future been as wide open as it is right now. Um, and with that, um, when we think about kind of the existential questions that that raises as well as the practical questions that that raises. Um, you know, there is gonna always be a struggle between the attention between freedom and responsibility and walking through that door. And with that, we know that there are gonna be some identity and developmental challenges. Questions of identity like, who am I? And who am I becoming? Um, questions about how a person handles their emotions uh, under the stress of transitioning um, and, and uh, going to college? Um, will I find love? Will I find connection? Uh, will I find a group of people to connect with? Um, and, um, you know, I think the good news is, is that, um, you know, you know, you have already provided them a deep foundation to ground them when it comes to values and life experiences that will hopefully 
um, help them take on that responsibility. And that said, you know, again, sometimes a first swing at things might not mean success, but it may take time and support. Um, but that tension is gonna be ongoing. And again, I wanna normalize that that's necessary. Next slide, please. I think for transfer students, um, the questions can look a little bit different, but still similar. So I wanted to take some time just to acknowledge that because that there are other institutions, they may have already made friends. They may have already found a degree of success. Um, and meeting new folks um, mid-year is gonna have some challenges as well, but yet still opportunities. I think students often come in with this uh, erroneous belief that all everybody's made their friend groups already and it's gonna be harder for me to, to, to break in. Um, I, I don't think that's necessarily true. I think that that's a, a, a static process and it's evolving. And um, uh, that said, uh, I think there's lots to be hopeful about there. But these questions may come into play. All right, next slide, please. So for parents, um, you know, again, I think there are some psychological changes that I think are important to expect, just as in some of the other periods of transition. Um, and, um, you know, you, you might remember back to, you know, I think this image uh, is tickles me a little bit because it shows kind of a, a toddler versus a, a grown adult, you know, and that, that uh, juxtaposition of, of the differences. But, um, you know, when people make transitions, they do tend to regress a little bit. So if you think about, you know, your students transition from elementary school to middle school, middle school to high school, there may be some similar challenges there. Um, and um, they also, you know, your students may send some mixed messages of maybe feeling a, feeling a little bit more needy and wanting more support. Um, and that's okay. And at the same time, they may want more independence. But this is a time to be able to make sure that um, your students, they need your, your growing trust in their competence and your steady nurturance uh, when they feel vulnerable. They may not always feel vulnerable, but when they do, hopefully you have the kind of relationship where they see you as their safe base to always return to. Okay, next slide, please. So I love this quote. Uh, if people don't recognize the image, I guess the name is there. This is from Mark Twain, it's from the 1800s. Um, I'll read the quote. Um, when I was a boy of 14, my father was so ignorant, I could hardly stand to have the old man around. But when I got to be 21, I was astonished at how much the old man had learned in seven years. Um, I like this quote because um, while some things do change, we can count on some things staying the same when it comes to adolescent development. Um, and Veteran, veteran parents who have launched children to college before know this. Um, even though they might be rebuking you or wanting distance, they will come back around eventually. Um, and I think the fact that this was written so long ago, I think um, offers me at least some confidence and in, 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 uh, kind of the, in normalizing the process that I think many of us go through when we launch our students to college. Let's go to the next slide. So what's different about this transition, um, and veteran parents know this, um, something that I'd like to propose is that this phase of development does pull for parents to take on a new role. Um, some folks may recognize the images in this, um, on this slide. Um, this is from an old Subaru commercial um, that really captures in my mind the emotional side of the process of, of how a parent might see their child in the first image versus the reality of how old they might be at present. Um, and, um, you know, I guess what we would like to propose is for parents to, um, you know, shift from being, uh, a kind of an expert of what, you know, a, a younger child might need to more of an empathic consultant, in essence, kind of a scaffolding approach that you've already been engaging in to, to nurture their growth. Um, and they're going to, because the reason this is important is because they need to own their own choices in order to develop good decision-making skills. Um, and so they can have some skin in the game. And so eventually you can retire and not feel like you need to be in that role of them uh, having to 100% depend on, on you for everything that they need. Uh, now that said, you know, I'm, I'm not here to judge anybody's parenting style and there are different cultural approaches to parenting, but um, this can be uh, good, good for everybody. Just some, some tips on how to navigate the new role we're, we're proposing. Geez, we have so many resources. Thank you for moving to the next slide. Um, um, 
we want to make sure that you encourage them using campus resources, encourage them to engage in their own thoughtful problem solving, perhaps before they approach you um, with questions. Um, and remember that mistakes are great teachers. Um, I want to skip the next slide if we could and go to the, the next one after that. Thank you. Um, this is a conversation model that uh, is proposed by the Jed Foundation. Um, so obviously I think it's important for parents and students to make sure that they navigate and are, are clear about how much communication they're gonna have with each other. But when parents, you know, when students call, you know, this is an opportunity to figure out, you know, what are they wanting from you as a parent? And for, as a student, I think it's important for you to think in, in advance, do I want to just vent or am I looking for for actual advice or guidance. So think about that before you reach out. Um, but this is a model that um, I think can really encourage good communication uh, for students. Um, you know, if you're a parent, have your student explain what the problem is without interrupting and really focus on listening. Um, and, and just ask how you can be helpful and help them then evaluate the choices that they might have and not choose for them. This way it will help them develop the confidence that they need. Um, you know, primary questions like, what do you imagine my advice would be? Because remember how I said you've already given them a root and foundation for some of their worldview of how they might uh, proceed in things. Um, um, be assuring and supportive. Um, I think you can handle this as a good example of a nice statement. At the same time, let them know that no matter what, that you're there for them. Again, being that safe base. Okay, next slide, please. Okay. Um, there's a lot of research that goes back a really long ways um, around what is important when it comes to students persisting in college and graduating in college. Um, and I, I think even, and especially for transfer students, um, because there's a, there can be a high dropout rate for transfer students as well. Um, but UD has many resources when it comes to registered student organizations, RSOs is what's listed there. Um, and finding connection, um, finding, uh, you know, a sense of belonging is really critical. It's not just about coming here and acing all your classes. Students that don't find that connection often have difficulty persisting. Um, having connections and, and friends will help them be more successful overall in life. We know that as adults. Our network is what helps us navigate the complexities of life and society and career. Um, so really, I would encourage you to really challenge your student and maybe even require that they, they look into registered student organizations that might line up with some of their hobbies and interests. Um, and even if it's just something they're curious about, and this is especially true for transfer and commuter students. Um, there's a website there, studentcentral.udel.edu um, that uh, has lots of good information on all the RSOs. Next slide, please. Now, regarding your students' mental health, um, you know, before they get here, um, you know, I would really encourage you all to have a conversation about how, you know, if there is a mental health concern that arises, how might you handle this as a family? So prepare them in advance. Um, I think it might be important for you to take the lead with this because they may not do so. Um, um, that's part of that dilemma of them wanting to appear competent and appropriately interdependent. But, um, you know, I think this is an area where it, it is a, a family family concern. Um, some important things around wellness like sleep, diet, medication, social life, academics, and finding balance with those things. How can they cope and manage things that might arise? Um, might be helpful conversations to have in advance. Next slide, please. I think we talked a little bit about this in the last session. Just make sure that you check your student self, uh, you know, insurance coverage. Um, and, you know, if, especially if they have pre-existing mental health concerns and if they have, uh, you know, medication needs, et cetera. Um, we are here for you um, in order to provide consultation in the community for mental health concerns. Also, many of your students may benefit from registering with DSS should they have uh, uh, a, a circumstance related to a mental health or health issue um, that they could uh, benefit from getting excused absences or extensions on assignments. Okay, so for uh, parents that are would be newbies at this, um, preparing for the return of your first year student is important. That can also be stressful, I think, for freshmen starting in the spring semester. Thank you for transitioning this slide. I forgot to ask for that. Um, um, so spring break, I think, will probably be the first time that a lot of students, uh, first year students, come home for the first time. You know, it might be a good idea to, you know. Uh, um, make sure that you have a conversation in advance about what your expectations are when they come home, 
you know, they're going to have been, they're going to be used to have been living on their own for a while and having their own schedule uh, while it is your home. I think it's important to note that they have developed new habits and it might be worth talking about in advance and communicate and negotiate what that time home might look like in terms of what you're hoping to avoid some conflict. Um, you know, it's interesting because a lot of students just evenings begin at 11 p.m. or so, I would say, in college at UD. Um, next slide, please. You know, so when you do come to visit, if you do come to visit, especially, if, you know, I think this is for first year students, plan ahead, let them know. Um, you don't want any kind of major surprises. You know, the life you save might be your own <laughs> to give them a heads up. I wouldn't advise that you just pop in and surprise folks because sometimes you might find something that might be jarring uh, or concerning. Um, next slide, please. Now at home, I think it's important to, you know, maybe, especially if you're the parent losing, you know, having the first family member leave home, um, you know, prepare yourselves. How can you prepare yourselves and other family members or maybe even the family dog, if you have younger, younger siblings, to prepare for, you know, the loss of, of that family member. Um, it's going to be a new evolution and phase, not just for your student, but let's be real. It's going to be a new phase for your family. Um, you know, and it doesn't mean that you're losing that person completely. There's, it just means you got to find a way to stay connected in a different way. You're still their parent or caregiver. Um, you know, 60% of, of students, even after graduation, return home for a time and boomerang. That's probably even higher now. Uh, I guess there's good and bad news in that, depending on, on who you are. <laughs> um, next slide, please. Okay. Um, I think we're about to end here. This is a resource that I'd like to point parents and students to. This is also from the Jed Foundation, which is a national organization that's federally funded that um, does research on how to support uh, the college transition for both parents and individuals, settogo.org, um, especially if you're dealing with any mental health challenges. Um, I would encourage folks to take a look at this website for resources. Um, it's already paid for, for through your tax dollars. Next slide. Just a few recommendations on suggested readings. Um, there are lots of good ones out there. I like uh, The Naked Roommate. It's a little bit old, but it's kind of fun. That's especially for students, uh, you know, venturing out for the first time. Um, that's a good one for students to read, I think. Um, and I think that's about it. If we could go to the next slide. Um, and that's it. I just want to thank you for your time. And um, I will, I suppose, stick around for some questions. I believe there is some time for that. Oh, and I guess there's one more slide there with uh, um, our UD helpline, the web, important web links to our whole wellness uh, uh, set of units. Um, awesome. Thank you so much, Kelly. And thank you to all the parents, families, and guardians out there. Um, I hope that you enjoyed this session. Just to reiterate everything that all of our uh, colleagues said, there are, are so many resources here for you and your student, and we are here for you um, and, and especially for your student to help them throughout their time at, at UD to set them up for success, not only here, but also uh, when they graduate and, and go out into the world. Um, so I will, uh, I will drop a link in our chat to the website, which has a copy of this slide deck, uh, a different iteration of this slide deck. Uh, for you to reference. But other than that, we will see you in the spring semester. Thanks, Connor. All right. Thank you so much, Helen Ann and all of our amazing friends from Student Health and Student Wellness. We really, really appreciate you helping us with that part of the presentation today. Well, last but certainly not least, we're going to move into our student Q&A panel for the day. So again, as we said before, this is a amazing opportunity for you all to ask any of your um, like last minute questions, anything you want to know. We have some amazing students joining us as well. Um, we have Aretha, Katie, and Geraldine who will be sitting on the panel with us. And we're gonna give you all a chance to introduce yourselves. We can start with Geraldine and then, do, oh, we can, I'm sorry, we can start with Aretha and then do Geraldine and Katie. Hello everyone, my name is Aretha Corsa. I am a junior with a major in political science and a minor in legal studies. Basically, I wanna do law. Um, I'm from Middletown, Delaware, and my pronouns are she, her, hers. 
Hello, everyone. My name is Geraldine Laura Silva. I am a junior majoring in elementary education with an English as a second language concentration. I'm originally from Smyrna, Delaware, and I use she or hers pronouns. Hi, everyone. My name is Katie Fisher. I am a senior environmental studies major with a minor in environmental humanities. I'm originally from the Lehigh Valley in Pennsylvania. My pronouns are she, her. Thank you so much. So like we said, this is the opportunity for you all to ask questions. So this can be about anything we've talked about today. It can be about what it's like to be a student. It can be about student life, getting engaged, or it can be about things such as getting around campus or eating in the dining halls or living on campus. So our students are here to answer all of your questions. And like Kelly just said in the chat, you can drop them in the Q&A box. But I think while everybody's kind of thinking about their questions and typing them up, we can get you all started. So a question people love to ask is eating on campus. So could someone talk about eating on campus and everything that that involves? I can go ahead. Um, so basically, luckily we have like a lot of variety on campus. Um, so there's Russell Dining Hall. So if you're looking for a cozy, comfortable place uh, to eat, uh, Russell is the perfect place. Connor and I grab lunch every Monday and Wednesday. So obviously that's where we love. Um, but there's also CR, which is the Caesar Rodney Dining Hall. And that is mainly for uh, variety. That's what I like to say. So if you can always find at least one thing to eat in CR. So if you're like really, really hungry and you're looking for a lot of things to eat, I would highly recommend CR. And then obviously we have places like Chick-fil-A, Quiznos, and a lot of other pop-up shops that you can find in the student centers, so Chabot and Perkins. And I know it's like a lot of information, but the gist of it all is that you always have a place to eat. There's always something to eat and your students will be well-fed. So I think if that's what you're worried about, it's going to be great. Um, I know that like I technically sometimes I go like on like um, dining halls but main main street is kind of close to uh, you, like UD so it's like right off the street so one of my favorites is the little French cafe I love that place it's like really beautiful and like their crepes and their lattes it's like all good so definitely recommend that place. I was going to say, I felt like you two summed it up really well. I definitely have lots of Main Street recommendations if anybody ever needs it. Thank you so much. All right. So, and that's all the information you really need to know about food, but we're more than happy to answer more questions if you have questions about how certain things work. Um, and actually, this is actually a really great segue into a question we just got. So someone asked about flex points. So if someone's able to talk about dining points and then flex and kind of how that distinction works. I can answer this one. Um, I like to compare flex to your on-campus debit card. So flex is something that you can upload um, money right into your account and then uh, the student can pay with their like actual like ID card. Um, they just have to denote if they want to pay with flex or points. And then points is kind of built into your meal plan. Um, and you get a set amount of points every semester. And that's spent typically on like more food things um, versus I feel like flex can be spent kind of anywhere on campus. I mostly use it for laundry, but it kind of covers more than points can. Thank you so much, Katie. I appreciate you talking about that with us. All right, so we have a question about logistics for winter session. So if a student is going to take a course over winter session, how could they maybe fund um, that course? So how can they maybe get some money to fund that? And then where and how would they live on campus? So with that, I will say there are a lot of resources on campus where if you're interested in a program and you first attend the meeting, um, 
there's a lot of scholarships out there. Um, and also if you already receive financial aid, it kind of like transfers into that. So if you already receive financial aid for tuition, then like you wouldn't have to still like bother about that. But in addition to that, there's a lot of scholarships, there's a lot of opportunities. Um, my friend is in Paris right now doing her study abroad. Um, and she basically has to pay for, I think a flight ticket and like a little extra. But apart from that, they provide housing, um, meal plans where you can eat. And then obviously on the weekends when you don't have class, you can go out and eat. Um, if you want but in terms of like logistics and things the school kind of takes care of that for you so it's a really easy process and very highly recommend for everyone um to add on to what Aretha said there's a specific program um that you could apply for called student support student uh, support services program um which is for students who are underrepresented um or if you come from a family of low income they uh they get you, you get free like tutoring as well as free classes if you are also a part of the program and if you're Pell eligible they get to pay for your winter course or summer courses so something to keep in mind. Yeah, thank you so much both of you and I think that um, Geraldine's comment really goes well into another question so this question was asking about maybe students um, like non traditional students so students either maybe with families or with different needs and I think just to emphasize what Geraldine said. I really, really recommend that students talk with their academic advisor so regarding academics that's a really great resource to talk to so that they can kind of navigate how to balance their other commitments with their commitments for being a student. The um, student financial services is really great to talk about things like Geraldine mentioned with getting funding or scholarships. So um, if any student is maybe a non-traditional student or has other responsibilities, maybe they work full time, um, it's a really good resource to talk to your advisor for academics, um, student financial services for um, anything related to finances, and then your advisor can also recommend things such as engagement and involvement in other ways. All right. And we have a question about, so when we're looking at starting classes, right? So what's the process for registering for courses? And then what's the process and timing for getting textbooks for those classes? Um, in terms of, well, I'll answer the registering for courses. In terms of registering for courses, um, you can you get like a set time of when you register um and typically for the spring semester it would be sometime in the fall um obviously for like transfer students um now would be the great time to register for your spring classes if you haven't already um and then in the spring um you'll get like a set like time to register for your fall classes things like that um, in terms of like finding out that information of when that opens up for you, I recommend UDSIS because they're very um, informative of like when the timeline is for things. Um, also for UDSIS, that's where you would like actually register for your courses. Um, underneath like UDSIS, there'll be like a courses and registration um, like section and then like a register for your classes section. Um, I also, once again, recommend reaching out to an academic advisor because they're very helpful with that. Um, and then in terms of buying books, I think it's personal preference of when you could buy your books. Some people um, will immediately go to the UD Bookstore website and you can put in your like course code and figure out what kind of books you need. And some people do it like weeks before they start their classes. For me, I'm somebody that likes to wait until I attend my first day of classes and actually gets like my syllabus. Um, because sometimes uh, the website might say it's required versus when I go in and the professor's like, yeah, this is optional, but you can buy it if you want. Um, so it's really personal preference of when you can buy your books. Um, it's also very personal preference of where you get them from. Some people like to do the bookstore just for convenience sake. Some people do Amazon, loan them out, things like that. So it's very much personal preference for books. Thank you so much, Katie. I appreciate it. All right. And we've been talking a lot about academic advisors, really kind of hammering home that resource. How would someone get in touch with their advisor or how would someone get in touch with a, another support system here on campus?
So one of the things that you can do is on UDSIS, you can have uh, you can contact your academic advisor or find out the email through there. Or another good resource is our Blue Hen um, Success, which is another website where you're able to see and contact and make um, an academic advisement meeting with your advisor, which I tend is like really helpful for me to like see when they're available and when they're on campus, because some of them work from home or some of them might not be on campus campus throughout the whole week. So that's really helpful. Yes, thank you so much. All right, so a question about getting around campus. So how do students get around campus? What are some transportation options? Um, and if someone could also talk about maybe biking and things like that, that'd be very helpful. So um, my first year, I did not have a car on campus. You do not need a car. I have a, my car on campus now, and I still don't use it. I only use it to go home, and that's basically all I use my car for. So it's a very walkable campus. Everything is really accessible. Um, with bikes, there are a lot of bike lanes available. People use electric scooters. So it really is um, it's very accessible for basically everyone and then also if you don't have a car on campus and you do want to go home we do have like a bus or shuttle system on campus um, that you don't have to worry about driving all the way to pick your student up they could just take the bus and come home to you Alrighty, thank you so much. So a, another question that we're gonna be asking about today. So someone's asking about housing, right? So looking at housing, so asking about like living on campus, but, in, but specifically like how can students live off campus? What's the possibility for living off campus? Um, and would a student need to have a meal plan? Kind of how would those work with some of those logistics? Um, I can answer this one. So in terms of like first years, first years are required to live in on-campus housing. And then it's about a 25% drop-off rate from there. So um, like 75% of sophomores will live on campus, 50% of juniors, and then 25% of seniors. Um, it's really personal preference if, once again, it's personal preference, depending on if you wanna live on campus after that. Um, I would say I like I always recommend that sophomores should live on campus just because uh, finding like off campus housing. Um, you kind of have to do it right away in the fall, so definitely recommend living on campus in spring and then it really depends on like the landlord for finding on campus or off campus um, housing I definitely recommend on campus. Um, I've lived on campus all four years and I haven't had a problem with it. Um, I know Geraldine's a commuter, so she might have a bit of a different situation to touch on. And then I know Risa and Connor are also RAs. Um, so I, I definitely recommend living on campus. I think the benefits is like location for sure. You're definitely closer. And then I also have a meal plan because I live on campus. And so there's a lot of convenience of having a meal plan instead of having to cook for yourself. Yeah, thank you so much, Katie. All right, so another question, um, and I'd love to hear from everybody on this one. So what's one thing you wish your family had or had not done when you transitioned to UD? I could start off this one. Um, I think the biggest thing is like my parents, like it was like, I'm a first gen student, first generation college student. So I think it was like, they didn't really know how I navigated college, but they were very understanding and they were supportive of like, okay, you're staying up all late at night to like study. So like they actually were like very motivating or like sometimes um, like I took a winter course and it was like Spanish. Sometimes they would even stay up at night and like try to like see me like, you know, help me. And um, it was like very beneficial because it was like a really good support system that we had. And specifically when it was like a bigger 
uh, Spanish course that I did not understand. So it was really nice to like have that support system. And I love that my parents did that. Um, I am the second child out of two. So my older brother is five years older than me. And my parents kind of went through the whole process with him before I even started college myself. Something I wish they had not done was kind of compare me to my brother. So if there's more than one sibling, um, know that the siblings are, might be completely different and they're going to have their own journey. I have a completely different journey than my brother did in college. Um, and so I wish they hadn't like compared me as much. Um, something that they did do though that I felt was really helpful was um, kind of throughout like high school and even like the summer before college they kind of like forced me to like explore things on my own even in my own hometown um so it kind of prepared me a little bit more for independence and things like that um and then in terms of like when I actually got to college they would wait for me to reach out um they wouldn't necessarily reach out right away because they knew that I was like going on my own time um, and then I didn't always have time to chat for like three hours on a random Wednesday. Um, so they always waited for me to like reach out, which I, and they still do. Um, and I really appreciate that. And for me, I think my family was very like, they let me be independent. So I had to learn how to communicate like, oh, hey mom, like tuition is almost due or like this is what's happening in my life or maybe this is what I'm interested in. Um, so it was basically like me taking that front seat and being like, this is what's happening. This is how I need help. Um, and basically them not being like, oh, you should do this, 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 and then being like, oh, so this is what you're doing and whatnot. And in terms of what I wish they hadn't done is they tried to they tried to convince me to change my major and do something I have totally no interest in. Um, and I think at a point that was really discouraging because I had to convince myself that what I was studying is something I really want to do. Um, and so that was hard at the beginning, but eventually they accepted what I wanted to do, but it was a rocky start during that time. Yeah. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. So another question regarding synchronous and asynchronous classes. So we already kind of went over what the difference between the two was, but this question is kind of asking like, are synchronous classes typical and kind of your experience with asynchronous classes, are those kind of like a rare exception? And how does that work when you look at classes? Um, most classes are now that we're moving away from like, um, like, COVID times, it's more an in-person, um, but say synchronous classes are more on a rare occasion, depending on like the professors. Like for example, one of my classes next semester is gonna be like one day a week we meet in person, then the other day is like, you can do it on your own. And then asynchronous, depending on the class as well. Um, I know that a lot of people prefer asynchronous um, if they're like busy schedules, but it really depends on the class or like your major as well. Thank you. And we talked about dining a little bit, but we're going to swing back to that one here. We have a couple minutes left. So this question is about using flex and dining points. Are those only used on campus or are there some sort of outside of campus options for things like that? Um, I can answer this one. So in terms of like value, it in terms of both like flex and points, it is a one-to-one -one value. So $1 would equal one point and then $1 would equal one flex. Um, in terms of off-campus off things, uh, those aren't, you can't use those for anything off-campus. I know there are sometimes like off-campus meal plans, but those aren't affiliated with the university. Um, but we do have a lot of different like cafes and food courts and restaurants that like are partnered with different restaurants off campus and they'll have like a pop-up shop in the student centers. And that is where you can spend those flex and points. I hope that answers it. No, that was awesome. It is a very confusing thing truly between um, like point, like dining points and then flex points. So thank you for kind of breaking that down for us, Katie. We really appreciate that. 
All right, and um, so looking at just having things um, like squared away before the semester starts. So where would students be able to go to see things such as classes and other course information prior to starting the semester? And how can those kind of be helpful for them? Well, luckily, the orientation department puts on a where's my class tour, where basically you can meet people, welcome ambassadors or people who are orientation leaders to take you around and basically be like, these are all my classes and how do I get there? And so basically you take a tour where you stop at all these different locations where your classes may be so that you can get an idea of where your classes are. And if after that you're still like a bit confused, you can go on the tour again because there's more than one, but then also your GPS is really, really helpful where it's like, you just put in your GPS and then you can walk there. So it's happening. Please tell your students about it. Um, it makes it really much, much easier to get around when you know where you're going. All right, awesome. And we have time for one final question. So again, this would be awesome if you could hear from everybody because um, I love all of your input. So. What is one thing that you would recommend for incoming students to consider? One piece of advice or one thing that you really recommend that um, incoming students take advantage of? Um, something I would say is don't be afraid to change. Um, I know I came in with a very specific major in mind. I am no longer in that major. I never would see myself ever doing that major nowadays. Um, so be like willing to change your major. Um, I know in terms of hobbies, my hobbies right now are completely different from what they were in high school. And so I've kind of really grown as a person because I allowed myself to explore new things, um, not get stuck in the same groove that I was in high school. And I think I really benefited um, from that. Um, I think also trying to be patient with yourself of like what you're doing or like making sure that like if there is change that you're trusting the process and trusting that everything's going to be okay um, because it can get stressful um, but also make sure that your student goes to like events on campus like there's a lot of different events in Perkins or Trevant that um, not many students know and it's a way to like join and be active or join RSO um, that's where I met a lot of my lifelong friends like through or on different RSOs on campus but and I will say please 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 do not be afraid to put yourself in uncomfortable situations apply for jobs that you think you won't get because you might get them um, do things that you've never done before and allow yourself to go through that process because that's what college is it's like a safeguard for you to make mistakes and grow from them and learn and just like be happy with who you are and the whole growth experience and please 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 take breaks when necessary absolutely necessary school gets a lot sometimes you start working you're involved on campus there's classes um so find hobbies that relax you and keep you grounded Thank you all so much for all of your really insightful answers. Um, it was very, very helpful to hear from all of you and for um, families and guests and asking these questions. I hope this is very helpful for you as well. If you have any last minute questions, please feel free to drop anything in the Q&A box. We are currently wrapping up and answering some of those questions. We're more than happy to answer any last minute things you may have. Um, we also are more than happy to answer any of your questions in the future. I'm sure um, someone else will drop it in the chat, but our email is otp at udel.edu. Um, so we are more than happy to answer any questions that you have on that email as well. But of course, we are always here to support your students. We hope that this orientation session was very, very helpful for you all. We really enjoyed getting to be here with you all today, and we're wishing you and your students the best in their transition to the University of Delaware. All right, everybody, thank you so much. Have a great rest of your day.